Right, well, we're letting everybody get filed in here. Welcome to um, the long-awaited RF Faraday cage match day. I was sleepless last night. Um, part of that was um, being excited about today, but also uh, just working on this and, uh, and a few other things, connecting up with some new friends like Steve Caldwell here uh, on screen that we're going to meet in a minute, who's down in Australia. So we were talking over through the middle of the night and who says that we don't have things we can't do. Um, one of the neatest things that I've experienced is meeting new people. I have met more people in the last three weeks than I probably have in the last 10 years of my career in person, right? Now, obviously, um, you know, the whole COVID thing has created a, a sense of community like we've never had before. And Pete, I got to say, kudos to you for this one. We were, we were talking one day and me and him and Mac were like, well, what are some topics we need? Little we know it wouldn't be too hard to find topics. Um, but we were talking like, well, definitely RF. RF is big. It's hot, as his James shirt indicates. Thank you, Hoarder. <laughs> and um, the, uh, uh, the other thing that we were talking about, he's like, well, we should do this and this. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah. And then it's like, okay, RF Faraday cage match day, right? Now these guys are all professionals and they work together on a lot of different things around the world. Um, but I think we'll find as we go through today that, that what makes them really great is that they think about things differently. And they think about things differently from one another even. Um, this is not some homogenous, everybody do RF exactly this way. Um, it's not, that's not the art of it, right? There's a science of it. And then there's the art. And, and we'll, we're gonna hear a little bit about all of that today. Um, before uh, we get into that, um, let's talk about Q&A, Pete and Mac, um, uh, how we're gonna deal with Q&A today. Mac, Q? Okay, well, uh... Today we're on the Zoom platform, which actually has a uh, Q&A window and a chat window. If you uh, click at the bottom of your screen on Q&A or on chat, it should open up a little sidebar window. Um, we'd like you to keep the questions to the questions uh, screen and feel free to chat or send us personal messages on the chat window. Uh, that'll just make it a little easier to uh, get to the real to the real questions and uh, be able to forward them on to all of the other panelists. And this is going to be recorded and will be available recorded? about 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. Imagine that. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm glad it's being recorded. It will be available. It'll be available about 24 hours after now from now on the archive uh, link of the Practical Show Tech website. Guaranteed, though, we will have at least half a dozen questions. <laughs> will this be recorded and available? Right. Uh, I think the, 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 the most important thing about this for us was being able to not have to binge watch TV the rest of our days. Uh, I think I was, I was already three weeks into not doing anything when, when the stay-at-home thing came along, and I'd seen everything I cared to see. And uh, Kelly and I sort of thought, hey, why don't we just do, let's do one show this week. Why not? And now we're doing about eight shows a week. So, uh, and it's been great. And the subjects we're going on are even extending into places like lighting and oh, video. Oh, but, you know, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, why don't we just go, Kelly, you want to uh, yeah. point us yeah, in the right direction? Introductions. I see people are still filing in, but it's stabilizing. We've got about 142 people logged in right now. Um, but let's start by introductions. I'm going to start with Andrew because um, his name starts with A, and that's the first slide I have uh, <laughs> up, ready to go. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty high tech that way. And um, what we'll do here is, bear with me for just a moment. There we go. The, got some, some, some pictures here. And Andrew, why don't you, um, you're with Bexel. Why don't you just give us a little, little background on, on A, kind of what you do now and how did you get here, meaning doing RF and things like that? Because we're finding through this last few weeks, um, everybody's uh, path 
has traveled a little different route to get to where they are uh, today. So uh, why don't you share a few uh, insights with us? Well, I have been with Bexel for about 21 years. I never, I never thought I'd work at a company like this. When I was early on in my career, I figured I'd be traveling the world, kind of like what Pete may be doing with uh, you know, his tours. But I decided that after eight years of NASCAR and truck building that I needed to get off the road. So I took this job in 98 and uh, I've never been bored. Uh, it's a it's a varied company that tasks me with a variety of opportunities and challenges, and some of them uh, started to become a lot of RF based challenges. So I just learned and grew and studied and studied and studied and and looked at how uh, the people around me that already knew some stuff uh, were, could teach me things. But I was uh, tasked with the responsibility of making things happen, even if I didn't have the knowledge to make it happen. I saw smart people around me at Bexel, other associates that, that would keep me out of trouble. Uh, so I started doing RF system design before I actually started to do coordination as a separate function. Uh, back in 2000, I had a, a, an a antenna receive combiner I had to build for a customer which I'd never built before 20 years ago or whatever. Um, and that just grew from there to a whole line of, of products and things that kind of glue RF systems together and then started doing coordination on the side as customers needed it and then developed a, a small following of people that liked the way I did it. And so they call me on a regular basis for different events. That gotcha. So, sense? you know, one of the photos we had was uh, looked like an NCAA event. Right. Yeah. Um, so those uh, soon sporting events and then uh, with Bexel is, uh, you know, broadcast, obviously, is probably a big component. And you said NASCAR. So, you know, kind of across the board there. Yeah. NASCAR was back in my prior career when I worked for the Nashville Network when I was living in, in Nashville. That okay. was my, my days of building TV trucks and being on the road. Um, the NCAA photo there is I think from 2015 and Rob Eubanks is the guy sitting next to me he's a, another Bexel engineer that's at the Staples Center in Los Angeles so I, I do regional things like because I'm here in LA I will do LA things if I live somewhere else I do I do events there possibly right uh, yep. but I'm also called to do events like the uh, the one where I'm sitting at the table uh, alone that's uh, New Year's Eve at Times Square okay so ABC hired hired um, me to do their on-air content protection for spectrum usage. And that was um, all the toys that I would bring to a, a major RF spectrum management event that I would be responsible for. Yeah, I see you got a nice big plot there on the wall. That's, that's a lot of ink. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I tend to do um, scans that are six megahertz or some multiple of six. Mm -hmm. TV channels are six megahertz wide. So I do a a 30 or a 48 or a 18 or whatever and then I stitch them together in AutoCAD and I print it out as a, a large graphic and I put it in front of a wall in front of me as a place to start. There you go. Back to our original topic, uh, Pete, uh, weeks ago, which was documentation, documentation, and a little more documentation after that. Um, cool. I, um, I'm going to move to Jason now, Jason Glass. Um, and uh, we're... Uh, we're here, we, we obviously seen you um, on a couple other webinars this week, uh, RF venue and, uh, or last couple weeks. And uh, why don't you, your, your angle while, while touching broadcast, RF, you know, obviously um, touches a lot of different things. Um, why don't you kind of tell us where, where you kind of fit in the marketplace with, the, with your coordination? Oh, well, uh, today it's, it's every kind of a live event you can imagine really from sports. Uh, I don't do my, I don't do any theater, not yet. Um, but it all started as I was a touring monitor engineer in 1990, uh, got, uh, assigned to do Tony Orlando and Dawn. And, uh, you know, Tony had a, a, a sure wireless. And at that time it was, I don't even think we were able to scan with our receivers. 
I mean, we just poke in uh, uh, banks and channels and try it and move on to the next one and try it and test it. Uh, and then by 1993, uh, I was out with an act uh, that made the, uh, they were making that transition to an act that had a couple of hits to they became a big act. And uh, we ended up with a rack of Sony 840s. Uh, it was at least eight channels of it and it was PLL tuned and my mind went boom. Okay. I got to start learning about this. You know, it's, uh, and then at that time, I believe we did have groups of compatible frequencies in the equipment that we would try, try it, test it, try it, test it. Um, by, 1996 or so it was racks of future sonics garwood radio stations and i uh, and i should mention i came from a background of being a teenager building am fm uh, fm transmitters from ramsey electronics kits and you know trying to build a corner cube antenna with aluminum foil and uh and then in college uh touched on some broadcast engineering ended up quitting school to go on the road uh, so my mind went back to, I need to know about more about what's, what's actually happening with this equipment and, uh, started studying. And back then it was libraries and, uh, uh, ham radio magazines, uh, AARL, AARLL handbook, um, and bought a spectrum analyzer. I bought my first handheld spectrum analyzer in the, in the late mid, mid to late nineties. Uh, and it cost me a fortune and it changed my gig. Because the monitor engineer by default is the RF guy. You know, it just, it's just the way it happens. Uh, and what ended up evolving, I, I continued to tour. Uh, I, I pretty much quit touring uh, officially at the end of 2013, but I started my business doing RF in 2012 because over the years I kept getting these phone calls you know, can you help me with this problem I'm having? Uh, here's the gear we've got. What do I need to do? And uh, local sound companies were hiring me to be their system tech for their RF systems on their bigger shows. Uh, and what I learned very quickly was to be successful in that job, you also have to know how to be a frequency coordinator. And then it evolved to I'm not taking the job unless they make me the frequency coordinator, because if there isn't one, this is gonna go sideways really fast. And they did, lots. Um, and then of course now today, uh, and by the way, I think it's two different jobs, frequency coordinator and system frequency technician, and then comms guy is another one that they pile on there. So the bigger the show, the more separate those, those three things I think have to be when it's a small show, you can do all three. Right. Um, so that by explaining that process, you could see now it's a much broader job. Right. That's, that's presented to you. Hey, do you want to do this gig? Well, what is it? Is it frequency coordinator? Is the system tech? Is it comms tech? Is it all three? And you know, we do our best to accommodate. If the gig's too big, you got to know when to say, well, look, I, I, can be your, I can be your RF system tech and I, can, I have to be your frequency coordinator, uh, right. but I can't do comms on this one. You know, it's more than just a couple channels. Sure. So, yeah, yeah. And, and what's interesting, what I hear different from maybe what we've heard from my Andrew already, and I know we're going to hear from a couple of the other folks, you came from a musical background. Right. Yes. So that's where you approach your originally came in this from. Right. And then we'll touch yeah. on that in just a little bit here. But I'm going to go to Henry and um, Henry. Um, I remember first time I met you um, was actually via phone. We were we were I connected you because I heard about this great two way radio interface you had with four wire, uh, four wire, two wire. And um, we and then I was doing a show and James said, Hey, I can't do it, but I got this great guy, Henry. And I'm like, okay. And, and, you know, it's kind of like gone on from there, just like everything else in our business, right? It's all about relationships. So, um, you know, Henry, what, what yours, tell us a little about where you're coming from, what your perspective brought you into RF and then what really, how does that um, uh, 
drive your decision making and, and coordinations? Uh, I got my my real beginning in RF during high school. It was the CB craze of the seventies. So I bought CB radios. Yeah, stuff was shaking his head. Yeah. Uh, so got involved with CB radios and a group of guys who were modding stuff and buying 2000 watt linear amplifiers and all that. And just like Jason says, you, you get into something and then you want to learn more about it because it was really exciting. It was really interesting. Uh, so I was buying some electronics books. Um, I was buying FCC technicians manual uh, technicians books on how to take at that time uh, a class two technicians license, I believe it was. Uh, and then a short time after that, still in high school, I went to work for the local GE two-way radio dealer who was servicing the state police in our part of the uh, county. So I went to work with him as uh, an assistant technician then moved to a technician. So I was doing all the installs in the cars. I was doing some bench repair work. Um, I was doing some infrastructure installs at the barracks. We'd do the master stations. I even had to climb a hundred foot tower one day. Uh, and all of that is, was a great learning experience, really got me interested in RF. At the same time, I had also been bitten by the pro audio bug. I was doing installs in the local hotels, the local uh, discos, uh, and then through a family friend's contact, I got into real pro audio. Uh, went out on my first tour right after high school. And because I had this two-way radio background, this RF background, RF microphones were just beginning to get into a production environment beyond TV. So we were just starting to see it with some of the major artists. And because I had an RF background, I was the only one able to keep them working somewhat reliably. Uh, started out with some old, old um, Vega and old Sony uh, stuff that hasn't been seen for years, Nady. Uh, and as I was hopping between uh, musical productions and legit theater and corporate, because corporate grew out of theater, uh, again, I got thrust with the wireless microphones because I was the only one who kind of understood it, was able to keep them going. Uh, and fortunately, unlike Jason, I didn't have to go out and buy my own spectrum analyzer. It was provided by the shop, so I lucked out in that. But yeah, absolutely. It was an absolute eye-opener the first time you ever uh, are able to visualize and see and get a real handle on uh, this invisible uh, thing that you're working with. And I was fortunate in that because I had started out in what I call the real world of RF, two-way radio, this predate cellular, of course. Uh, I knew about a lot of other workflows, practices, equipment, a lot of passive devices, filters, things like that, that just no one had any idea about in, uh, uh -huh. in the world of wireless microphones. And after that, uh, in your monitors. Uh, so it just kept growing and snowballing. Uh, then when I came off the road, uh, I went to work for a startup, uh, motion laboratories, but since there was really no money coming in for any of us, I had bought a whole bunch of two-way radios just to rent out. So I got back into the two-way radio uh, realm. And at the same time, people were still calling me about wireless microphones and how to get systems to work and they were having problems with it. So I sort of got dragged back into that. And then as I've gotten more and more calls, especially on higher end shows from you, from Pete, from others, uh, the knowledge base and the workflow of wireless microphones had to increase dramatically, especially as system requirements grew. And everybody was just adding wireless elements everywhere. Uh, so fortunately I was able to bring a lot of experience from the two-way radio world and the fact that I had always stayed in that, putting together repeater systems, doing high-powered PLs, high-powered comms, uh, which is basically constant broadcast uh, transmission systems on two-way radios. I was able to bring a lot of that to wireless microphones and merge the two and really get some high-performance uh, microphone stuff going, both uh, for off-the-shelf as well as custom-built stuff. 
Yeah, yeah, and we'll get into that in a little bit on kind of um, where the custom comes in and where the off the shelf merges with that. Um, I, I'm back on my alphabet correctly now. So now I'm to James, um, you know, obviously if people were tuned in, you know, you know a little of his background um, and, you know, certainly you've helped to educate a lot of our industry, but give us a, just that, that quick elevator pitch on who James Stoffel is. Cause I'm, I, I think we know, but it'd be good because I think what I'm hoping everybody understands is as we continue our conversations, the, where we come from, helps to determine how we problem solve. And it takes a lot of different perspectives. Pete? And I just want to point out when James starts that at the end of this presentation, the person who's the most attentive to our presentation will win all of the toilet paper in the background there. <laughs> oh, good point, good point. We'll need your FedEx number though. Shipping, shipping extra. There will be a handling fee as well, because come on, we can't do stuff for free right now, people. You know, need a gig. So James, go ahead. Just. Uh, Give us a, a quick rundown on that. I'm going to throw some pictures up for you. Sure. And if you uh, just allow me a moment, because Henry's a dear friend of mine. We've known each other for over 30 years. And you did say it was an RF Faraday cage match. So I did. So so, so I'm going to scroll ahead here. That's right. You there tell we are. that Henry Cohen fella that he couldn't coordinate his way out of a wet paper sack. <laughs> <laughs> I got something for you right here, Henry, and there's lots more where that came from. Order. <laughs> woo, woo. Hang on, hang on. You know, we all we all have our. All right, all right. man. All I like that, James. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> hey, Love you too, stuff. You said it was an RF Faraday cage match. That's Henry, right. I, I should have started it out a little battle. So thanks for coming prepared to do battle. But, you uh, poor people missed the visuals on that. Uh, uh, we saw it. We saw it. It, was, it went in a tiny screen. We saw it. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah. So anyway, I have known Henry a long time. Um, I started off um, in the industry from a different end, from professional audio, in all seriousness. I was a radio surveillance technician in the U.S. Navy Submarine Service for six years. So my job was to monitor communications and if the equipment the communications equipment failed I was also the maintenance uh, repair tech and um, when I got out of the Navy um, I went to a company called Vega Wireless which Henry mentioned and that's where I met Henry it was about 1989 and uh, and he began to grill me on wireless comms and wireless mics this and, was at an AES show yeah and in Dave Andrews shop in uh, Manhattan back then uh, and so my introduction to, to the audio industry was coming as a radio uh, technician with a military background. And when I started looking at the schematic diagrams of the, the, the wireless microphones, they looked incredibly similar to the comms gear we used on a submarine. So I said, okay, I could follow this. And working at Vega, I probably coordinated several thousand um, different shows because I was the guy who did all the frequency coordination and antenna system design for every single customer that Vega sold to, right? unless they were sophisticated, like say KP over here, Kevin, you know, he would do his own, obviously um, Henry, but for the, for the, for everybody else, I was that guy. And then we would go out and, um, and help oversee the installation of large systems, designing antennas and come up with um, uh, a quick way to test uh, all of that equipment because once you leave the Broadway theater now there's no more factory presence so I was that factory field guy for a number of years and then uh, around 93 I just wanted to get to Florida I'm still down in Florida I love it down here started a professional wireless systems uh, there weren't many wireless companies back then there might have been maybe three in the entire country that focused on uh, on wireless mics specifically and so when Pete Erskine uh, was doing Super Bowl uh, in 1997, uh, he got my name and that's how I met Pete. He hired me for my first uh, Super Bowl in 97. Uh, before that, I did the World Cup as a coordinator when it was in the US. And there was no shortage of large events uh, to do. I got really into that end of it because uh, I was uh, the frequency coordinator for the Society of Broadcast Engineers in Orlando. And so people would come to me as in that position and then once, and once it got beyond uh, just some numbers and you needed somebody on site, 
well, there was no such term as an RF guy back then. There was no RF tech back then. Um, you know, there were only two or three of us back then that um, interfaced RF with the audio of, of uh, dozens and dozens of microphones for a music event, for example. And so when you get thrown into the high end of, of the audio industry and you know the least about audio, it's really smart to pay attention to all the audio mixers that are yelling at you because the gains don't match on a couple of mics or because they're out of phase. So now when I go into a large event, and we'll probably talk about this later more, but the first thing I do is not set up my antenna systems. I go through and trim all my mics and, and, and as much as I can so that I could do my faxes to the truck in the front of house and monitors with a whip antenna on the back of my splitter. As long as they hear the correct phase and, and um, amplitude from all of the mic gains, happy. And they're not worried about a dropout until we get into rehearsal. So I find myself now approaching it first from the audio guys, because he's my client, right? Like I have a lot of masters to answer to, like most of you guys do also. There's four different truck mixers. There's all these people, the in-ear monitor guy also. So I, I start there and then I think about my antenna design. And that also gives the production a chance to build the stage and the sets so you can see what obstacles you might have when you do set up antennas. So we're still, still doing that today. Um, the latest endeavor, of course, as most of you know, is Radioactive Designs. It's a comm company. And we did that for a lot of reasons. And we'll probably get into some of that as we go through these slides later. Mm -hmm. That's it yeah. in a nutshell. Nice, nice. So, um, let's come to Kevin. Kevin Parrish, ding, ding, ding. And by the way, mm. thanks for the gloves. Um, you know what, get, get the mouth guard on for later because we're coming back to this. And Henry, <laughs> we, we got some topics and it's gonna be big. Um, so Kevin, um, thanks for joining us today. Why don't you um, share a little bit of your story? I'm gonna put up, uh, I'm gonna put up a couple slides here because um, you have a, uh, a very uh, storied uh, background because your, your, your job touches a lot of different things that are non-traditional microphone, IFB maybe that, that some of us directly from audio. So um, uh, why don't you kind of walk us through that? Sure, thanks. And it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you today. A lot of the living legends in the industry. Uh, my background is very similar to Henry Cohen. As, uh, as a teenager uh, back in the early 70s during the CB craze, I was kind of bitten by CB radio. I'm a native of San Francisco, and so there was a lot of that going around in the big city. In those days, you had to be 18 years old in order to have a license for CB radio. So my mother actually got the official CB license. She never talked on the radio, and you know, here was her little baby boy out there, yap, yap, yapping. So through CB radio, you also got to uh, meet people that were involved in amateur radio. Some of the people involved in amateur radio were also uh, involved in broadcasting. Just one block away from me was a, uh, an old ham, and it turns out that he was the chief engineer of KFRC 610 in San Francisco in those days was you know, one of the top 10 radio stations and you know an am in the united states and he had a big ham station down there and come on and check all of this out and everything and it was pretty cool and there was something about hearing my name he would say here's your name in morse code you know it's like wow <laughs> that's pretty cool so all of this stuff kind of led on one to another to another and i would describe myself as a person that uh, ha have been truly blessed throughout my life to have many big brothers and big sisters and mentors. So when I was 14 years old to go out and play touch football, no, I, I didn't, I really didn't care about that. I was learning about, uh, well, when, when you take off that little press fiberboard back off of a television set, you better not touch this <laughs> because it's gonna bite you back. And so you kind of learn a few lessons along the way, the hard way, but you, the, the exposure and meeting other people um, led me one thing in, into the next, again, CB radio, amateur. I had an interest in still photography. At home, I had a small black and white uh, lab down in the, in the basement. This was in San Francisco. And wherever I went in those days, I always took the camera with me. And just, just to, to, to take pictures. And it was all black and white. So I was out with a couple of friends one evening. We happened to be on the Bayshore Freeway 
hospital curve in San Francisco and just up ahead of us was a terrible accident where a couple of people ended up dying, multiple uh, car rear ender, cars exploding and so on and so forth. The highway's at a complete standstill. And one of my friends says, go out and take some pictures of that. You know, and I'm kind of like humming, humming, humming. So I get out and that was it. And of course, cars are, you know, going and snap a few frames. And so eventually it's over and done with. And one of my friends says, well, let's call up the newspaper. They may want that picture. And I said, no, they only take pictures from professionals. So we call up city desk, blah, blah, blah. Hey, I got, you got what? All right, come right in, you know? And then next thing you know, voila, here's my picture printed in, in the newspaper. So then I thought, wow, this is, you know, the subject of course was very, very sad, but this was, uh, you know, kind of cool. And so that kind of led into an interest in the news business stills back then and I sold more photographs and then through all of this I, I had come into contact with some uh, TV cameramen in those days there was no video I learned the business on 16 millimeter news film was kind of hanging around with them and I was kind of like well well how do you hear the calls well we have something that's called a police scanner oh how does that work so the interest just kind of consumed me and just sucked me in and all of this back in those days. And, and, and here I am more than four decades later, actually earning a living doing something that kind of started out uh, as, as a hobby. Uh, so in, back in that time, I started out as a, as a film messenger and I would uh, drive around. I was still in high school then and go out and, and uh, meet all of the, the cameramen and pick up their, their 16 millimeter film and schlep it back to the station, so on and so forth. So the, this evolution just continued and I, I really loved the news business and the bug bit me. And you know that, that was in the late 1970s and uh, never went back. So this evolution of working at a major television station in San Francisco, in engineering, uh, the station I worked at, we were the first station in the Bay Area to have a, a live truck. So that was a six foot solid grid microwave dish that we would climb up on the top of the, ban the van and actually pan in the dish by hand and line it up. So all of these wonderful things you look at like, how the hell did we ever do that uh, before? So that has led to a very, very wonderful uh, career. The San Francisco Bay Area was good for me and I wanted to be like the cream of the crop and get up there and, and work on the network level. And uh, again, I was, I was primarily working as a film cameraman, uh, but because I had some experience in RF and installation, we would get all news vehicles, you know, once a year, every two years or so forth. And it came oh, well, let KP do all of the installs. So for those in the two-way radio business, the, you know, the old Motrax and the Mocom 70s, we were primarily a Motorola shop. You know, I took care of all of the installations on the truck and so forth, and that kind of grew. And I had aspirations to move up to the network uh, level. And uh, I came to New York for the first time in 1984 and worked for ABC Network, Summer Vacation Relief. Capital Cities bought the company shortly after that. I was away from the scene, moved back to San Francisco. My telephone rang early one morning out in San Francisco, and it was a call from WNBC. And they said, we hear that things are quiet out in San Francisco. We'd like to offer you four weeks worth of summer vacation relief. Four weeks only. There's no permanent job. There's no jobs here. There's no guarantee. Would you like to come to New York for a month? And I said, sure. That will be fine. You know, love to do that. That was in 1988. Uh, so they, you've signed the paperwork and you're there just for the time. After my second week that I was there, I was extended for an additional two weeks. This kept coming, so on and so on and so forth. And I, I, I never left. Uh, so I moved from WNBC over into the network side. This is about uh, 1990. And that's where the career just took off with many, many more assignments of national significance and international travel. And it's, it's been one hell of a ride. And the whole time wireless has only grown and, you know, everybody who thought that automation and computers were going to somehow uh, replace um, the human role. Well, 
I think we're finding that we just have more computers to control, uh, frankly. And and I'm I'm we'll we'll come back to some of Kevin's uh, experiences here in just a minute. And uh, Steve, hey. welcome. Thank I you. just met you. Well, I met you via email a few days ago. Yeah. <laughs> I met you overnight, and at like one o'clock this morning, we were chatting because Steve uh, lives uh, in Australia, and with all the automation that we do have, we were still having so much trouble figuring out what time it was wherever we were, right? Yeah. But um, Steve, can you share with us a little about um, what your background is? Because you're bringing, oh. while the similar perspective, completely different, right? So. Yep. Well, it's uh, 6.30 in the morning here. I've been up since four, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm a bit, uh, a bit lethargic at the moment. Um, I started out really as, a, um, as a, an audio tech. Um, I took a job with um, Jens Electronics, who is a local distributor down here of so many different products, including the Shaw products. And I started as an audio tech, and at the time they, uh, they had a bit of an issue with repairing radio microphones and things like that so i thought you know i'll give it a go i've had a bit of uh, experience in the past like kevin and james who did cb you know all through the you know late 70s early 80s and things like that um i built a few coast guard radio towers up and down the east coast of australia so i had a, a fair idea of about rf and what to do with it so um i jumped on the on the tools on the analyzer and stuff like that and um I don't know, within a couple of weeks, I was the uh, only uh, Shaw factory trained RF tech in Australia. 10 years later, I'm still servicing Shaw product. Um, I used to go out and do a lot of events for a local company um, that was a patron of, of Jans at the time, which was Norse Productions, who I work for now. Um, used to go out and do um, spectrum management and repair RF gear for them. And they used to do overseas things. So I'd always go overseas to do um, jobs with them. Um, they offered me a job. So 10 years after being with Jans, I joined Norwest Productions in uh, 2008. Um, the first real, the, well, the first real job I had um, in the RF industry was probably to uh, Sydney 2000, as Pete will remember. That's the first time I met Pete. Um, I was called in to look after a few RF issues that they were having. Um, they couldn't get some range out of some old UHF series and things like that. And they also had issues with... Um, a lot of their Crown IQ networks from a local AM radio transmitter and things like that. So I was called in to fix a few issues like that. Um, and so they eventually said, look, come and work for us. So I went and worked for Norwest and just led to, to more and more things. You know, Athens, went and did Athens. Um, all, basically all the Olympic games since then with Norwest. Um, that's, it's not a huge part of my job. Um, and they only come around every two or four years or anything. So I, I, I actually work as a, uh, an audio tech in the, in the shop repairing, um, you know, commercial audio equipment and professional gear and stuff like that. And I do a fair bit of RF co um, coordination for other people all over the place, both in Australia and also overseas. Um, and that's just gone from there, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's in, it's interesting that um, our our industry, obviously, with with the import and export of all this technology, is is very similar. But we're going to discover in just a little bit how different certain things are, even though we have access to nearly identical gear and nearly identical technologies. How it's implemented, there's always a little bit of difference there. But before we do that, we cannot forget. Peter Erskine, right? The guy who brought us all together on this. It's like a game show. It's somewhere between Brady Bunch and then whatever that game where you talk in the box and you're looking down at the person that, you know, um, somebody will remind me of what that was. Um, but Pete, give us the background of what brought you here because you you didn't come up necessarily through music. You didn't come over from from the radio shop the same way as, as like Henry and Kevin described. Um, you know, yours, yours added a few things. Can you uh, well, do that? I actually did start in radio uh, in college. So I went to WKCR, worked for there for a couple of years. And then uh, Bob Turkow uh, found me and hired me to work for uh, Bob Kiernan in a company called Creative Theatrical Services. And this was in 1969. I installed my first wireless mic bought from Europe by Bob Kiernan. They were a VHF wireless mic. We installed about two dozen of them for a, a, a public housing facility that had a uh, theater they wanted to use, use it in. 
And we got it in there and it, we were all handhelds. There were no lobs on this particular thing, but they loved it. They were all doing shows with it the next day and it was great success. And then I met uh, uh, Lou Shapiro. We started a, a company, uh, Creative Theater, uh, Erskine Shapiro Theater Technology. And early on, we became HME dealers and started renting uh, HME uh, crystal controlled wireless and immediately I realized I had to somehow coordinate these. And so we had a, we had a, a basic computer we used for business work and I programmed a third order intermod program in that to just select these fixed frequency devices off the shelf, but we had to get them, had to make sure it wasn't complicated. We were doing more than half a dozen mics together, but they didn't all work together in all the right places. So uh, when I finally got in, into real RF, using IAS, uh, it got to be actually a whole lot easier uh, than trying to do, do the other. Uh, all of these people on the screen, the, the Brady Bunch as it were, uh, I have met in, in various shows around the world. Uh, Mac I hired early on uh, uh, to, uh, at Theater Technology from right from the beginning. Uh, Steve Caldwell, we worked on the uh, Sydney uh, uh, Olympics together. Uh, James obviously was the Olympics. Jason I've known for years and years. Andrew I met uh, later on uh, through Bexel. And Henry, I used to rent walkie-talkies from him all the time. So uh, it, I won't, don't want to use the word incest, but... <laughs> but it, it, it don't. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> but but it, Pete, but I'd it, just like to remind you that I came to you for a job back in the early 80s when you still had... I didn't want to hire you. You, you, wouldn't hire you me. needed to be sent off on your own to start your own walkie-talkie company. I knew that had to happen. So there we go. There we go. But... Uh, but the whole community, one of the things I love, which I missed terribly this year, was going to NAB and seeing all of you at NAB, Old Home Week, yeah. where we not only saw maybe something new electronics-wise, but more importantly, saw each other again. Um, and it, it's been great. And uh, I love working with all, you all. And uh, uh, Mac, is, is I've done a lot of shows with Mac because he lives only a few miles from me here. And... Uh, we, we both got kicked off of a, a bunch of shows a few months ago and decided we might as well do something with our spare time. So we started this little uh, get together thing. So it's been good. It has. And, and I think that's the, the key here is, and you know, some people will be like, come on, I want to get to the fighting, right? And we will, trust me. Um, we're, we're just about to launch into that, but I can't stress enough how important a, a network and, oh, I did want to share I what I did in my real RF work. Uh, this uh, is a page that I developed over a long tour with Bon Jovi. Every day after I finished coordinating my 40 wireless microphones, I would go out and do push-ups in the venue and post it on here. Of course, a couple of them Giving aren't really, thanks. <laughs> exactly. A couple of them weren't really uh, 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 venue oriented. They were, they were uh, uh, like when I went diving in Mykonos, Greece on our day off. Uh, but near the end of the, of the event, um, I did start doing my push-ups out in front of the audience uh, during the uh, break between the opening act and the real show. And uh, that ended up being uh, not my downfall, but the end of the tour. They, they didn't kick me off for it. But uh, it would made me uh, keep my sanity instead of doing 150 shows with the same thing day after day, living the uh, the, the dream. There you go, and and you know what? I'll throw this challenge out then. Everybody that's online here, let's uh, let's see about doing our RF uh, push-ups. Share those on Facebook. Share those on LinkedIn. How you staying healthy during this time, right? Because Pete, I'm going to expect a report on Monday. All right. So we don't eat through all of our food because we go out, buy all our foods for the week. Right. And then, you know, it's like, Oh man, all this food sitting here. I got to eat now. That's right the problem with there. this. We go buy food to last a couple of weeks and I eat it all right away. <laughs> so he wants a time lock on seven different uh, refrigerators exactly. That's for a completely different topic. And I'm pretty sure we need like some licensed counselor to be a part of that conversation. So anyhow, Let's move into why everybody's here. And um, yes, it's Hollywood Squares. Thank you, Rom. Excellent point. I can't remember anything. So 
I'm going to lead off with probably what I think is one of the most important topics in today's society, COVID and 5G. <laughs> okay. It's this definitely a sarcastic. problem. This is me being a little sarcastic, but a really a lot of truth here that there a lot of science is is misunderstood and misapplied. I mean, we're, we're living in the day of science right now, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn my screen off, Pete, and everybody else that's on here. I'm going to probably point to Jason real quick because I'm going to let it start there, all right? So, um, Jason, you, you kind of lead us off with where you think things are at. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, I've been kind of outspoken about this subject uh, on Facebook and with my friends. Um, so we're, yeah, the, the radiation we work with is called non-ionizing radiation. It's radio frequencies. Uh, the frequencies that make ionizing radiation that is very harmful to living things is much higher in frequency, uh, orders of magnitude higher in frequency. Uh, and that kind of radiation, it penetrates through living things. It, it collides with DNA and RNA molecules. It breaks them. It causes mutations, uh, the same mutations that allow evolution to work, but also cause cancers and major health problems. Uh, it, it, it kills living cells in, in a few different ways. Uh, Non-ionizing radiation, uh, it, 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 the powers that we use it at, the powers, uh, you know, the level of amplitude that's bombarding our bodies from all different directions. There is evidence that in, in the long term, these low level signals over time might possibly cause some long term health issues. There is not only no evidence, but plenty of contrary evidence that those signals do not cause acute, sudden onset, deadly symptoms like respiratory disorders and pneumonia. And aside from all of that, we have the scanning electron microscope, which can show us pictures of viruses that do do those things. So the reason it's become such a pet peeve for me is because in, in the last week, we've seen news stories about people attacking cell towers in Great Britain and setting them on fire. And uh, I've received a number of personal messages from friends. Hey, have you seen this? 5G is causing people to die from coronavirus. Uh, so I think what's happening is we're, we're all very frightened. We're, we want to understand. We want to understand the world we're living in and what's so dangerous to us. Uh, and so we turn to someone we know. Hey, Jason, you know about radio frequency. What's the deal here? Uh, and that's the best I can tell you about why these things work the way they do and why it's not probably the thing that you should be most frightened of right now. Uh, and it, and to, to try to convince you to not try to make that giant leap in logic between, okay, these radio frequencies, the, they heat up the water in our cells. That can't be healthy. No, it can't. It's minuscule amounts of heat. It's a different thing than the kind of radiation that penetrates right through the cell and breaks apart the DNA. Um, so it's, it's, I want to encourage you to not try to make these giant leaps in logic that, well, if it's bad in that way, it must be bad in this other way. And it's going to give my grandpa pneumonia. And I, I, I hope, that, hope that's a good kickoff. Let's talk. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, Kevin, anybody, uh, Andrew, Steve, anybody, Henry, any thoughts you want to? I add think that one that? of the one of the scary things about five uh, G and what we do in general is it's very, it's not understood by by very many people. It's all magic, and uh, uh, the 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 five G stories about uh, uh, being a danger to our life and wrecking our weather satellites and stopping everything on earth from working uh 
have been growing and growing and growing and growing. It's no wonder that conspiracy theorists have grabbed it to think about COVID. So I don't want to, I, just like uh, Jason said, I don't want to click too much on this because we shouldn't promote bad ideas. Well, Pete, just to make one correction, there is an actual concern about some of the 5G frequencies. I think it's the 28 gig frequency that could be a co-channel interferer with uh, satellite receiving stations. At. See, now that's science. <laughs> that's a lot. It's correct. not likely to instill mass fear and make people take to the streets with pitchforks and torches. Only if it upsets their WWE reception. Yeah. Or their mutual funds. Right. Well, that, that yes. could easily be true. <laughs> Steve, oh, have you seen anything? Or sorry, go ahead. Uh, our viewers might appreciate anybody in the panel here that knows more than me uh, getting into a little bit of the detail of 5G, like what frequencies does it operate on, where maybe has it been deployed so far that they might not know about, and any kind of plan that anybody here knows about in its uh, how it's going to be deployed in the U.S. or Australia. Henry? All right, I'll start. So 5G is a protocol technology, um, fifth generation. We had 2G, 3G, 4G, now we're up to 5G. It's not frequency band specific. In fact, there are three new bands up in the gigahertz range that are going to be used for deployment, uh, 24, uh, 224, uh, two bands in 24 gigahertz and one band in 28 gigahertz, and I believe a band in 32 gigahertz, if I remember correctly. Uh, as well as you will see 5G deployed in 600 uh, megahertz and 700 megahertz, and eventually in the 1.9 and 2 gig that we use today for PCS services. So it's a protocol. It's not a specific frequency band. 5G is an IEEE standard, not yet. They haven't, I believe, have not actually published the final standard yet. So if you're looking at your phone and it says 5G or 5GE, that is a pre-5G, very close to what the final standard will be. Um, so close, in fact, that just a quick firmware update from the radio node manufacturers, uh, uh, Siemens, uh, uh, Nokia, uh, and the others who make the actual base stations. Uh, will push out towards the, to the carriers and the carriers will push that out to the base stations and then that will get pushed out to your phone. Uh, so we're, the 5G that you see now is not the real 5G that we're going to see, but it's almost close enough, but it does require new, new radio equipment to do that. And, and somewhat just marketing right now. Uh, yes, for the most part, it absolutely is. Although uh, the T-Mobile 5G that's out and the AT&T and the Verizon, even though they're all pre-5G, they're very, very, very close to what the uh, 5G will finally be, presuming your phone is actually 5G capable. But the, the, the ones down in the lower bands, like 600 meg, aren't going to have the dramatic increase in speed that the higher frequencies will have. They'll have barely any increase over LTE. Uh, it depends. Uh, now, when you have somebody like Dish who owns four blocks in New York, one of the things about 5G is it can do dynamic uh, channel aggregation. So at any given moment of time, it might be able to aggregate, you know, 18, 19 meg for what, for something you need. So you can actually see some pretty good uh, uh, bandwidth and throughputs at that frequency. Where it's really going to shine is up in the 24, 28, and 32 gigahertz range where you can have 100 megabit channels, 100 megahertz channels, sorry, uh, and push a lot of bandwidth through that. But obviously you wouldn't want to hold a 24 gig rate phone to your head. And you're not going to. That, uh, that frequencies, those frequencies are going to be sort of like what we see in terms of Wi-Fi networks today, uh, where the client will be an access point or ba the base station will be a client, will be a, a WAP, a wireless access point, and the client will be in your laptop or a desktop client. It's going to be a long time before they can build anything like that into phones. So I've, I've always called 5G lowercase 5, 
because it's not actually five, but uh, is yeah, 80 gigahertz. Point, yeah. The 80 gigahertz, I believe, is also uh, 5G. Because I know. Uh, I've yes, done... I believe you're right. I, okay. I don't remember all my bands. I understood that from some 80 millimeter wave stuff I was doing a couple years ago. Did some health health research on it because there were concerns in my shop when we were testing the radios here at uh, Bexel um, in our lab that people were concerned with the health concerns with 80 gigahertz radios and we we did the research and we published that to our, our the group of people in the building so they understood it better so a lot of it is communicating that was a very small picture of it we had 40 people to talk to about it uh, four people were interested in it here we've got four billion people interested in it and you know x number of people talking about it so it's still though a function of communicating whatever we can do uh, Jason, like uh, you were being asked to respond, um, you know, we, we all, all get those questions. So it's on us to do our own research to some degree. So we have answers that um, propagate correct thinking within our group. Yeah, and we should mention that even at 80 gigahertz, it's still non-ionizing radiation. That's correct. We, we, it, it has different properties and we don't know whether it's more or less harmful than the other frequency ranges we've been using to a great degree yet, because it hasn't, that, that technology hasn't been around as long. Uh, but we don't get into ionizing radiation until I believe we get up into terahertz. Yeah, there, uh, there's I, some skin, there is some skin heating effect. Hmm. If you put your hand in front of the beam, depending on the research you look at, but mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't radiate, especially the 88 gigahertz stuff that I'm dealing with. It's hyper directional. It's good for a mile and the beam is maybe five inches wide by the time it gets to the receiving dish. And but, these, these frequencies don't penetrate uh, physical objects very well from what I understand. Correct. Yeah. But so, it's an interesting fact though, the millimeter wave at 80 gig will pass through water molecules. So it, it, there is no rain fade because the waves are smaller than the, the molecule structure. So it sounds like my body is in an enormous amount of danger. Kevin, when he was starting in the industry, probably was in a bit more danger, focusing by hand those dishes. And uh, you probably didn't want to put your hot dog in front of those um, for cooking. Well, and right, we should mention, I mean, if okay, an FM radio tower at 101 megahertz, if you're on the tower, and they go hot at 500,000 watts, it'll cook you just like a microwave oven at 2.4 gigahertz cooks the hot dog on the platter. But we it's don't all... live in the tower, and that's the good news. Exactly. Right. Uh, um, inverse yeah. square law. Inverse uh, square law. You and your math, Jason. Man, why you got to keep bringing that back into this? It's an inverse square suggestion. You can't bring <laughs> absolute. It's a mere Not suggestion. In our culture. Exactly. So... So all that to say, I'm going to sum up real quick. COVID wasn't caused by 5G. 5G does not make COVID worse. And um, COVID, or I'm sorry, 5G will do one thing when it does come out. Most likely your phone bill will go up and your data package costs will go up. All right, that part, I'm going to go out on a limb there for a moment. Um, the performance, we may find, though, that we're going to be very thankful for 5G five years from now in terms of the technology it's going to provide us. But the headaches of getting there, eh, we may not enjoy those as much. So I am going to get into the topic that 5G created for us, unfortunately, in the U.S., and that was the repack, right? If it wasn't for all of that, we wouldn't have all this great space available, right? And Kevin's got a nice big smile on his face there. Um, you know, so I'm going to say that. So one word, repack, the big R, right? So um, share with us some um, uh, what, what your experience has been the last two years, right? What, what you know, is, is this, I think it was a good thing personally on some levels, uh, just to start a fight. Um, I think it was good because there's other good things that got accomplished um, in terms of technology I'm gonna have access to as a consumer, um, 5G probably being one of them at some point, not as an audio guy, I, like, I do like having that. Number two, um, it got people thinking about their role in RF, right? And things like that. So what's the repack meant to everybody? Um, more or less, 
thoughts? I'll let you weigh in. It's been Dollar good signs. for business. Dollar signs. Yeah. Dollar signs. Okay. Yeah. I mean, cost and income. Um, cost and income. Right. Yeah. So people are seeking us out now. Before you had to, you know, you were lucky if you knew somebody who knew a production who was looking for an RF guy. Now everybody's looking for an RF guy. And that'll, that'll become a, a normal part of any, any remote production or field production or when you first start out. That'll, you know, that, that'll be something that is, is included with any show. It, it, it has to. It has one, of the to. Things, one of the things I see is sometimes shows are very protective of their wireless frequencies and uh, don't want them published. On the other hand, when we get together, we share what we need to know. Right, right off the bat. If we're doing a show right next door, even if our producer says, don't tell anybody, we're getting, we have to tell them because it's going to protect us as well as them. Absolutely. Plus, you can be watchdogs for one another as well. So yep. you have an understanding yep. who's on first, the guy across the street, and the, I'm a news guy, so everything I'm doing is outside in remote broadcast production but I get it on the, on the Broadway theater side. But if you are someone who maintains the attitude that, no, my frequency lists are exclusive or whatever, you, 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 you want to come play Faraday cage or hardball, you light up and I'm going to find you just like that. That's yeah. one of the things, you know, that, that you do, you got to know who's out there. So yeah. it is foolish to have, in my opinion, it is foolish to have that type of, of attitude that there's something secret or restrictive. In, in Midtown Manhattan, there are two large television networks that are located across the street from one another. So one might think that uh, for competitive advantage or whatever is going on that you're not going to, you know, network A is not going to talk to network B across the street. It's, it, is, it is just an op, it's just the opposite that you must communicate with one another and who's on first. I don't know who's on. No, there, there is the communication. And when it works out, uh, it, it, when you have this communication, mutual coexistence, even on same frequencies can exist. And it is mutually beneficial to talk with your neighbor across the street or in the theater next door. I've always been one. Here's the list. Here's what I'm doing. Oh, and a lot of times that has actually been a benefit to me because they'll say, well, so-and-so is coming in tomorrow or they're not here yet. That's the main frequency that they use for, you know, the PL base stations and it's crystal controlled and they can't change and blah, blah, blah. So that gives me a heads up in, in the case if I was not frequency agile or had to get some other equipment brought in or do whatever. Uh, that allows a little bit of uh, buffer and cushion for me. So I think sharing the information with the appropriate people uh, is, is very, very beneficial and something that I have done for years. So Steve, have you yeah. guys, did you have any kind of, do you have any ana um, um, analogy going on like around this repack? What's your spectrum availability? We're a couple of years behind you guys. We, we finished our uh, 700 megs repack, you know, quite a few years ago. And there's, there's nothing on the horizon that we can see as far as, you know, breaking down the 600 meg band yet. Um, we're quite lucky in that we have only a handful of uh, terrestrial TV stations and most of them are on VHF anyway. There's only a few UHF translators uh, in, the, in the capital cities that, that we have to be wary of. Uh, a lot of the regionals have a lot of UHF uh, transmitters that you have to be cautious of. But, you know, um, I think I was telling you earlier, the biggest issue we've had was on the Gold Coast when the Gold Coast Olympics were on. We had, um, was right on the border of Queensland and New South Wales and New South Wales had its UHF transmitters. Queensland had its UHF transmitters and uh, there was very little space for us to work in. But that's, that's, that's a fairly, uh, you know, that's a single case out of the whole of Australia. We're, we're generally pretty good down here. Um, most of the cities operating in VHF still. Um, so it's not really that much of an issue, but I'd like to um, reiterate what KP was saying about, about the knowledge thing. I think that is the key. I think um, is getting, getting the information about who you, who is about you and who else wants to use the spectrum, especially when you're doing 
large events. I think that's one of the major things that you need to, you need to focus on. Um, well, actually, Kevin will know because every time we do an, an Olympics, I'm on the phone to him and saying, hey, KP, what are you, you're coming over. What are you bringing? You know? And I'll give him a, a bit of an insight into what spectrum is available and stuff that, to give him a heads up as to what gear to bring and stuff like that. So I think that's the real key is to actually talk to people, find out what they want to use. You need to get all this information before you can calculate anything anyway. I mean, you know, we, we had four, 500 frequencies just for ceremonies in, in, um, in Rio and over 7,000 across the entire site for the entire Olympics, Olympic Games. And there's no way we've been able to do that ad hoc. We have to get all that information up front, get it into the system, work out who's what. You know, we, we had to do spectral coordination. We had to do temporal coordination. We had to do all these different things to try and fit all that gear in. So it's, it's a really a, a matter of getting all of your, all of your information up front, um, working out who, who's got what, who can't move out of what band, who's got the most agile equipment, who doesn't have any agile equipment, all that sort of stuff. So I think, I think being open about, about what you're doing in the spectrum is, is definitely the key. And we're and all the, in the same boat. You have to be a good neighbor. You're, I agree absolutely. with you 100%, Steve. You have to be a good neighbor and a responsible operator. Yep. So that introduces, I think, a really where, where this all leads to is part 74 in the U.S. Uh, we were all talking ahead of time. And Steve, obviously, we were um, chatting uh, with um, this part 74. We hear a lot about that. Everybody get a license in the U.S., right, to um, – get get on here and, and uh, Kevin you brought up a really interesting point about this um, I saw a question here or not a question but more of a statement that yes the repack has been really costly to vendors right they're all this gear that's no longer usable so I don't mean to diminish that cost but the challenge is we represent such a minuscule amount of the marketplace in the in the government's eyes right and um, me as a putting myself in the consumer seat, I'm like, well, I, these wireless mic things, I don't even know what that means. I just want more data because I'm working out of my basement, right? And I'm tired of my internet provider or whatever it is, right? So part 74 though, fast forward to that, how do we be a good neighbor, right? And, and I think one of the things that we, we talked about was number one, get a license. Part 74 license, absolutely 100%. Right. Get find that. Get that. Number two is, though, I get that license. So, Kevin, I get a part 74 license um, that helps me be a good neighbor. Right. But talk about a few things that, that you brought up um, earlier that that the benefits of these licenses really are. Sure. Well, your voice is counted. You you it's like having your your car with a license plate on it. You're out there. There is some some database people know through registration who's out there. How many motor vehicles do we have in the state of New Jersey? If we didn't have vehicle registration, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know that. So this problem crept up a couple of years ago uh, when I was invited along with others in, in the industry. We went down with the manufacturers and spoke on a couple of occasions at the FCC. And FCC is looking at data. So they said, well, in the United States, I don't recall what the exact number was, but as an example, there's only 10 wireless mic licenses in the whole country. Well, anybody, we know that there's more than 10 people that are using wireless mics out there. And because it just wasn't, no, even if you were eligible back then, I'm talking five or 10 years ago. No, you went out and you went to your local dealer or whatever. And it's not that anybody did anything wrong or was operating illegally or anything like that but you just went down, you, you bought the equipment that you needed to do your job. You used it every day to do whatever you're doing, your productions, your, your Hollywood professional sound mixer, sports, so on and so forth. So it was just kind of like assumed. No, no, there's, there's nothing to worry about. Now we fast forward when the spectrum that we're using is, is under attack or others are looking to come in and take some of that away from you or repurpose it for other things. And so the government, FCC, they're looking and said, well, there's only 10 people licensed. And as a, as a community manufacturers, another, we're saying, hold on, you know, there's in the United States, there's 5 million 
wireless mics out there or there's 2,500 users or whatever the case it was, there was no data, license data to back that up to, to prove the point. So as, as time continues on when there are spectrum challenges, it, it is important to register yourself, get the license, you're part of a community, they can reach out who, you know, let, let's get a hold of this person. How many mics are you using? Are they still active? There's some hard data, and we didn't, we didn't have that. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this, James, or Jason, or really anybody. You, are you guys threatened by the fact I have a Part 74 license? For instance, I, I have one. I got one because I, I feel like, number one, if it's available to me, I should be using it, right? I don't even know why. It's kind of like buying some tools. You just get it because... Like, well, it's a tool I'm supposed to have. But are you threatened by the fact that all these Part 74s are out there? Are they taking work away from you? Are they interfering with you? I mean, what anybody got concerns about this? Well, I think one I, of the parts of it I, I wanted to point out is just because you have a Part 74 license doesn't mean you are, ha, can actually have priority over anybody. That's right. You're, uh, you're right. bound to cooperate right. by right. law. Right. right. What? Yes. Uh, I have an opinion about this. I don't feel that it in in, I don't think they're taking my work. I do feel that it opens the opportunity uh, for, well, well, not the opportunity, the, the drawback that we were talking about before we went on the air uh, about people without technical proficiency holding licenses. Your dentist has to have a license to pull your teeth. Anybody with a pair of pliers can do it. But the license assures that that dentist isn't going to kill you with anesthetic <laughs> while he's doing it. So I feel that it's very important that you should uh, 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 have a certain technical proficiency that qualifies you to have that license, uh, which is what the old rules implied. Uh, and the real world uh, uh, circumstances right now, we have uh, 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 users uh, using 941 band equipment. They're doing a scan with their receiver. They're, they're programming their equipment and then they wander around a city for a week with a 941 band frequency that they have no idea that they're required by law to, to coordinate every specific frequency in the 941 band with a local SBE coordinator. And it's more, even more complicated than that. And it's not that portable. Well, the lower part of the 941 band, there is actually no mechanism right now to obtain the information that's required to do an accurate coordination in 941 because there's no governing body that we have access to to coordinate with. So in, the in a timely a little, fashion, yeah, in right, a timely fashion. Right, in a timely fa fashion. And right. it would be prohibitively expensive. Right. If every one of us was to coordinate a microphone in the, through the same process that a microwave tower operator uh, conducts that, it would be very expensive and very time consuming. So there's a certain amount of proficiency that I think should be required. Okay. So... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum this topic up really easily. Everybody should get a Part 74. Everybody should educate themselves, correct? That the resources, and Pete, I think, Peyton, Mac, this is a great opportunity. I see a number of questions in chat, things coming up. Yeah. What are these resources? Where do we get these books? Obviously, those are some things you get with degrees, okay? Um, if, you're in, if you're getting a degree in electrical engineering and, and with a study in RF, but um, uh, none of us necessarily came up that way. One of the things I do pride our industry in is making ourselves smarter through education, right? And so um, I would suggest that A, everybody gets that part 74 is kind of what I heard here, and B, as Jason said, you, you do have an obligation to know the nuances of that ignorance is not, you know, right. an excuse, right? right? Um, and just the way a license doesn't give you the right to do anything you want. So responsible um, operation yeah. without being a dumbass. Yeah. It, and look, it doesn't have to be complicated. Go to Wikipedia, go down the rabbit hole, spend, we have time now. 
go down the rabbit hole. Read Follow it all. those links. Read it all. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. So if Park 74 is not, go ahead. Sorry, Andrew. Go ahead. I'm going to throw a punch here. Okay. So uh, I think it was um, uh, Jim Dugan used this phrase when he was working, when we worked together a few years ago doing system design. His motto was first do no harm. When like being a doctor, in, the Hippocratic yeah. Oath. Right. When you enter into an RF environment or an event space and you have a transmitter, ENG bag, whatever it is, your first responsibility is to not hurt anybody else. Yes. And the coordinator's job, and this, this would happen to me on the events that were open to the public, like New Year's Eve, Times Square, where there's no pre-coordination except with the PA company and the broadcasters and everybody else is just Wild West. I'd have all the A2s walking around Times Square looking for people with antennas. And they'd hand those people my business card and they'd go, no, I don't want a frequency. I'm good. I'm like, look, if we give you one, we promise not to give it to anyone else. So you're protected. And we'd have to prove our point that coordination is a benefit to everybody. Not, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a constrainment. It's a, it's a freedom. You know you're good there. I will never let anybody else have that if everybody plays well together. So and the side think, effect of that is is the side effect of that is if you get them on board all of a sudden they're another set of eyes for you absolutely you know, yeah they realize <laughs> that you're protecting them and yourself right and so now they're looking for someone else around, they hang on a second. this guy's probably not coordinated what's he going to do to me as well so they all become another set of eyes for you which is you know you exactly. get particularly if you're on a show where you are flagging right. receiver antennas yep. with a big red flag and you, they, I've gotten calls from people I've coordinated. I just saw some, uh, an ENG crew walk by with no flags on there going yep. over to the left side of the stage. You deputize and, everybody by bringing them on board. Exactly. And the other set of eyes, they also... Oh, they're there. The That's the flag I look for. I knew it. Yeah. And, and, and down the line, they also serve in the, in the role of educators as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. We're all in the same boat together. So it's mutual respect and responsible operation. Since it's Years the cage ago, match, I'll throw this out there. It sounds like communism. It works for me. Ooh. And it is. It's everyone cooperating. Yeah, it, yeah. It's a commu commune. It's a community of it. The Years ago, in, a, in an effort for self-preservation, the NFL uh, with Jay Gerber decided to have frequency coordinators for their games. And that was because they had 120 frequencies that they were using for each of the games that they wanted to protect. And the only way to do that was for them to go out there and coordinate everybody. And it's grown into one of the most amazing programs uh, ever in sports in terms of coordinating. For, as far as the NFL concerns, you can't go to a game without pre-coordinating. And if you go to a game – you either have to leave and you haven't coordinated, you have to leave your wireless in the truck. Can't use it. Um, and but, here again, Peter, the education by just being exposed to that process, that is an education for the end users of the equipment, the ENG crew or whoever. Exactly. And, and that effort on the part of NFL for game day coordination continues on. So when and they show other up, events, absolutely. other events, I've had people walk up to me because they recognize me from an NFL show and say, can I get a frequency? Sure. I'm a but current no. EFC in the NFL, and a great deal of our effort goes into education consciously. That's, that's a, a very conscious focus yeah. of our, our group. Uh, and it does bring up a kind of tangential discussion that, you know, none of us as frequency coordinators has the right to uh, legally dictate. You can only use this frequency. Belongs to everybody. It does. But here, at least in the States, and, and from what I remember down in, in Oz, uh, touring down there, what gives us a little bit of leverage is the control over credentials to be in a physical space at a certain time. Like, uh, I, I can't prohibit you from using that frequency you that you have that legal right you have a part 74 license uh but if you don't want to cooperate i can have security put you out in the alley yep. so that's the difference we frequency coordinators we don't have legal authority i hope everyone understands that 
Uh, there's only there are frequency coordinators in the country that have legal authority, but that's for two-way radios and licensed services. And that gets back to that 941 band. That's that kind of frequency coordination, and it's time-consuming and it's expensive. Well, that's well, not us. During the, the during the debates, uh, Larry Estrin, with his with, dealt directly with the FCC, and on all of our debate events. Still to this day, we have an FCC official with the power to arrest people right. on our that's, show. That's a special circumstances, and th those are called, uh, Henry, what is that? They classify those, and they, they declare certain events as nationally important events. Mm -hmm. And that yeah, that's gives... Under part, that's under Part 7424. And yeah. actually, to some extent, that gives us... Uh, as event coordinators, a certain amount of legal authority, although it's tenuous and I don't know that it would hold up in court, uh, because sort of like when you get to a yield sign in the roadway, nobody has the right of way, but you are under an obligation to yield to everyone else. So the way the part is written is that if you are a licensed user, you must obey or you must listen to what the coordinator who's been designated either geographically by committee, the event, whatever, what he says. It doesn't give the coordinator any specific rights, but it's telling you as a licensed user, you must listen to the person who's designated as the coordinator. Uh, and that can be for short-term events or, or specifically and, designated. Uh, and Henry, at the, at the conventions, when there's been uh, problems with, uh, I mean, it's only happened a couple of times uh, that I can recall throughout my career. When there were some non-cooperators, the sergeant at arms or a deputy of the sergeant at arms for the Republican National Committee or Democratic National Committee would go over and they say, blah, 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 and here you go. As, as Jason mentioned, with the NFL, you're taken out to the alley, not to be beaten or anything like that, but you're escorted out. And, and I so did not say like that on the NFL's behalf. No, no, no. That was my <laughs> musical right. events. I can't speak for the NFL. Okay. All right. But out, okay. All right. So I'll to thank you for the correction. I'm sorry. But so the, in, in the case of the political conventions, when you have a non-cooperator, the sergeant at arms in worst case scenarios, would be summoned and the, whoever the non-cooperator gets well, a little a lot, talking to. A lot of that comes down to property rights or event rights in that as an ENG person or even as a production person, you're here as an invited guest. You're here on our property or our leased property. We have a temporary lease by the fact that we're renting the venue. You have to play by our rules. Absolutely. You're more than welcome, but if you don't play by our rules, we're going to ask you to leave, and we may do more than that. So. And it may, be, it may be important for us to point out, if there's any event organizers watching right now, making acquisition of a credential, making a, a promise of cooperation in all aspects of the production conditional is something that you can do very easily to make this job, frequency coordination, and many jobs involved with the production much easier. Right, well, and it actually, set off an information flow. That's absolutely right. So in other words, John Smith is applying for a credential or a producer is applying for credentials and there's a box. Do you intend to operate wireless equipment other than a cellular telephone at this event? Please click here. And then that would take you to the next step. So I, I agree, very beneficial. And I think by virtue that here in the States anyway, we have less spectrum to operate. People may get themselves into, into trouble and in, in those in the past that may not have uh, actively participated in spectrum management and frequency coordinate. I'm gonna go do whatever the hell I wanna do type of stuff. Um, I, I think there's gonna be a lot of education that, that's gonna come around post TV repack here, here in the States, but certainly for events um, where credentials are, are given out, that would be a helpful full step on the production side. And likewise, it also points out the importance of a spectrum manager and a frequency coordinator. So the event, whatever it is, if you're going to have outside media or media day or press preview day to come in and see a Broadway theater show or something like that, then there's these other safe gaps 
that can be put in just through the flow of education and information. So to protect the, protect the event, Peter and Staffo have been out there and, and Steve Caldwell have been out there for months setting up all of their gear and a TV new crew, news crew comes in and they hose the whole deal for them. Nope, and I, I certainly don't want to be that guy or, or the dumbass. Yeah, no, that and that's a good point. Um, I think, you know, obviously we've been talking about really high-end shows, right? Big, complex things. But what I do take away from everything you said here, guys, it sounds like in structure, there is freedom, right? Meaning if I can create a structure that everybody can operate in from the smallest event to the largest, that's a ballroom with a, with an, with a ENG crew that comes in a ballroom with the, with the client's video crew that just walks in that, that just brought their own wireless. There are all these simple plans that we can put in place that says, look, I can give you the freedom to move about without interference on either side, right? So all this stuff you're shooting over here, it's going to be completely usable when you get back to the edit suite and you don't have everything stomping all over it, right? So, um, you know- people, And a lot of this stuff doesn't cost a penny. Exactly. It doesn't, it exactly. doesn't cost anything. So it right. can be part of a smart- Cooperation smart never costs money. That's exactly, right. Exactly, exactly. So Pete, why don't, we, why don't we jump a few questions here before um, I, I throw down on the decked and VHF, UHF comms front. Well, I think that we've had a couple of dozen questions about Part 74 and licensing. And I think that that's a subject for an entire- Exactly, I think, we've, I think we've established because that pretty well. We say it in one sentence, Part 74, but it has lots of different ramifications and, and, and operational things. So we won't really deal with that anymore here. Um, one person did ask from our venue, what, what do you think the chances are of another FCC auction happening, like selling off the 500 megahertz band. Well, I was going to say, what band is he talking about? Uh, well, probably T band 14 through 20, I guess. Right. Well, well, so that's on, that's on Congress's yeah, yeah. docket. It's ongoing. It's yeah. well, right. the problem with when the um, the Middle Class Jobs Act was passed in 2012, part of Title VI, which dealt with the auctions, included an extremely poorly and badly written section about. Uh, T-band having to be auctioned uh, of all public safety entities. Right, right. Uh, and that auction is due to take place in 2021, and the spectrum would have to be cleared by 2023. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the legislation was written so badly, so poorly, and nobody double-checked it, that what the people who wrote it, which were mostly from the IT industry, didn't understand is that it's not just public safety who operates in that. It's private land mobile radio as well. Right, and right. that it's only, well, now it's 13 markets. A lot of different, a lot of different markets that have to deal with it. Well, but not, it's not nationwide. Right. So uh, anybody who would have been the likely bidders have no interest in this spectrum because right. it's highly encumbered. It's right. not nationwide. It's only in 13 markets and it would be encumbered by private land mobile radio users. Including okay. oil and so, gas, who have a lot of money and influence. Right, now, on, on but a, they're only in the Gulfport states, really. They only have on, a, there. on a slightly different subject, um, we all do wireless mic coordination. That's pretty easy. It's a frequency wireless mic, that sort of thing. But now we've got all these wireless comms coming in, in DEC and EDGE and all these different bands that some people think, oh, that's in DEC, that's in Wi-Fi. I don't have to coordinate that. It's not true. Uh, how do you all deal with those kind of coordination issues? Well, Pete, before we move on to that, let me just finish up real quickly about the T-band because that auction is still scheduled to happen. However, there is legislation uh, in the House right now uh, to repeal that portion of the uh, Middle Class Jobs Act, as well as the FCC, uh, the Office of Management and Budget. and So it might not happen. The GAO have all come out and said the auction would be a complete failure. Uh, repeal this now, get rid of it. So right, odds right. are, and I strongly believe that it will not, the auction will not take place. Like the first, uh, first run through of the 600 meg with the total failure. Uh, yeah, well, the first four. Yeah, the first yeah, four. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They did demonstrate in, uh, interest though, to the point that they uh, chose to continue. For right, sure. Right. 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 Oh, yeah. Right. 
So right. back to the 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 bands like Deck well, and Deck, Wi-Fi. We don't and... need any of you anymore, right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's not needed anymore. Because that's all. That all takes care of itself. Care of it's itself. Not a you guys are a dying breed. Just so you know, exactly. we don't need <laughs> exactly. Okay. I can get a computer to do this, right? That's or it. even this is not. The, the, just this turn is it the on. Part, this is the part where you need to put up the Abbott and Costello. Who's on first? Exactly. It's very appropriate. Who exactly. is on second? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, so but, are you saying it's not like manageable? Is it just going to be, is it free flow? Just, just because it's unlicensed doesn't mean it's uncoordinatable. Okay. So, and we see this uh, with five gigahertz band as well as 1.9. Uh, Yet another five. Well, but a different five. It's the real, <laughs> right. five. It's the real five gigahertz. To the tenth. Right. Uh, and soon six gig. But uh, what I'm saying is that the all of the the bands, the the buyers of the equipment, are somehow com coming in thinking, okay, I can just turn it on. I don't have to coordinate. I don't have to set a frequency. I'm going. What do I have to worry about? And well, they're going to have to be taught is, all over again. Yeah, well, by coordinators due to marketers uh, to the marketing uh, divisions of the manufacturers, and to a large extent, they're correct. If you are your own small little show. Uh, nobody else is nearby. It can, in fact, be a plug-and-play system and go, uh, other than configuring the buttons on the bell pack. Didn't somebody say, first thing we have to do is kill all the marketers? Marketers? Yeah. No? Oh, whoa, 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 that was Shakespeare. Whoa, whoa. Oh, okay. And cooperate. <laughs> I, I want to say one thing here, I think, because the audience might want to understand this specific point, which goes to something you just mentioned, Henry. Um, you said unlicensed devices. And I want to, I want to just, and this is a cage match moment, Kelly. Well, so here you're you about go. to say it should actually be called license free. I'll agree. Uh, yeah. whoa, or whoa, whoa. It's, the, it's <laughs> the equipment is licensed under a particular part, not the user. So the, the part 15 stuff where you have to accept interference from someone else. And you also have to not interfere with anybody else is the same for your cordless phone at home and your computer. It's all, it's all, built and manufactured under the FCC's part 15. Um, the users don't need the license, but the gear does. Well, the so, gear actually has a certification if you want Okay. To, yeah, so it, they don't use they put up your the fist licensing you do the users and certification for equipment. Hey, so Steve, just while we're on this, what about, what about down, what about Australia with licensing and, or this, I'll, I'll, the unlicensed so Andrew can, can, um, slap my hand on uh, using the wrong uh, terminology. Uh, where, where are you guys coming in on this? Because a lot of us are traveling around the world thinking this is great. I'm going to throw this in my bag and woo, unlicensed, baby. Here I come. Yeah, it's pretty much like that. You're talking, you're talking deck in particular now or yeah. just everything in the, the class yes, license? In, in general, we're, we're, because we're throwing around unlicensed, but you know. Yeah, uh, we don't have much of that. It's all class licensed down here. So as long as your gear fits, um, fits the requirements, you're allowed to use it. Um, we have pretty stringent um, TV, uh, you know, guard bands and things like that. We're, in Australia, we start at 520. We don't have the luxury of starting at 470. So, uh, but we still go to 698 at the moment. So we've still got a, a fair bit of space. Um, like I said before, most of the TV stations in Australia are VHF. So there's a fair bit of space around. And really, there's not, it's nowhere near as congested as it, as it is in the US. You know, it's... You but what about your 1, 9, and 5 stuff? How yeah, is that? I mean, I mean, decked is not an issue. There's, there's probably maybe a thousand decked intercom systems in the whole country. But, but you still need to coordinate them because if you have three users oh. of 1, 9 in the same show, they have to be it at does, least limited they, in their number of bell packs or where their antennas right. are. But the coordination process is fairly limited in the in the um, in the equipment itself. There's not a great yeah. deal you can do in the equipment itself. You can occasionally change from the U.S. band to the you know European band or the whatever, but there's not a great deal you can do other than that. You can't well, choose you, specific channels. You can you can limit the number of belt packs maybe they use. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can limit the number of belt packs, but I mean, if it's a tall time division anyway, who cares? I mean, so, but do you see your role, Steve, in there? Like, I'll I'll use the Olympics, right? Because you're involved with that. Yeah. Hey, not, there is a limit, though. Obviously. Even though even yeah, though it's time division, there is a functional limit. There's 50 time slots in a deck band. 
Uh, uh, Riedel uses a half a time slot. Uh, Clearcom uses two time slots per pack. So then it becomes a skill of spacing out your radio zones so that you can fit more packs into a bigger space if you space out your antennas correctly. And then that is kind of a coordination. It's more of a logistics of users yeah. than it is assigning frequencies. Right. But right. Are they coming exactly. to you, Steve? Expecting yeah, in, well, in, you? in Rio, for instance, we, we had to use the entire deck band, all, all three of them, to try and fit everything in. We had to get special dispensation from the, uh, from the government to do it, but they allowed us to use it, the whole thing. Um, you know, people were bringing decked equipment from all, all over the, the world. So we basically had to use the entire, all three different bands in, in one go. So, yeah, there's, you know, there, there is some coordination required, but it, compared to, like, standard radio mics and things, it's fairly minimal. Uh, and like mm-hmm. Jason was saying, it's, it's more about logistics uh, and things like that rather than, than actually giving somebody a channel. You just can't give somebody a channel. No, no. But- but are, do we become the arbiters then when, you know, if, if Kevin comes down there, right, and he's, he's doing, you know, again, Olympics, let's use that. Just, you guys are meeting up, you know, and he goes, well, I need, I need 15 packs over here. And, and this network over here says, well, I'm using the same system and I need 15 packs over here. And, and all of a sudden, we exceed what we know the system's capable of. Where do you think we as, as the, the coordinator fits in that decision-making part. Do we just go, hey, you know what? That's for you guys to figure out, build a wall with aluminum foil. Yeah, not I think problem. it probably comes down to priorities. Another right. thing you can do with coordination is maybe move up people off, off full duplex comms and onto two ways and things like that. Oh, um, now you're just talking crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think you're going to get like guests, it, but maybe you should have right. intercom that uses VHF. Kevin <laughs> just hit on something too uh, that, uh, or I'm sorry, Steve just hit on something that, um, we should be prepared to not say, no, you can't, but to say, yes, but let's do it like this. Yeah. Well, the yes we part. have to have a, a, a solution prepared. But the right. other part right. is... Try to think ahead. Because the they don't want to hear no, they want to hear yes. Let's tell them no in a yes way. But yeah. the other part of this is, too, is that in, in, you know, as far as the role of the coordinator goes, is that we must be educated and know what use of that spectrum, what's currently taking place at any given venue. Because remember, there's an IT aspect to all of this as well. So we're coming in as production with a wireless intercom system. Perhaps there could be Cisco, you know, uh, decked phones in an office or in the same venue or on the stage or wherever it may be. So it's important, uh, I believe, especially with this band, of taking a little extra time before you, to, before you deploy to identify, reach out however you can uh, with the theater or the production or if there's a coordinator and say, this is what I have, this is what I'm intending to bring down. What, what's the local scene? What can you tell me about that? rather than you just showing up with your gear, unlicensed part 15 and turning it on and expect, expect it to work because you might get one hell of a surprise. Yeah, and uh, Kevin's point, that's, to Kevin's point, that if that's on, on even small ships. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't have to be the Olympics or the Super yeah. Bowl to need to check that stuff out because there are deck telephones that are totally out of our business sphere but still have an impact on, on what we do. Well, but I mean, the other thing we need to do is protect you against... Um, so, sorry, Henry, go ahead, Mike. Oh, okay, real quick, I was just saying, as frequency coordinators, you should know the entire spectrum outlook and spectrum situation of the venue or the surrounding area that you're going to be responsible uh, yeah. to, co- uh, to coordinate or operate in. So right. So if you're thing, if you're operating with a if 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 you're not a full time coordinator and you're operating with a small inexpensive spectrum analyzer, be aware that you you want a small inexpensive spectrum analyzer that can reach to the two point four gig band, so yeah. that you can see those other you could see decked devices in one point nine. I would argue if you're in a venue with phones. I would argue six gig because there's five gig cordless phones as well 
yeah. as well as access points. The other, the other thing I think we need to, to hone in on is this is all very good, but what about hey, the other thing we need to protect against is people doing land grabs. I found that a lot of broadcasters, you ask what they want to use, and they'll, they'll request 20 frequencies in every single band. And you turn up and check their equipment and they're using three. You know, that's, Jason, that's, what, that's, what about the 60 mics on the Tonight Show? <laughs> yeah, well, and also, you know, on these musical things, uh, we will occasionally get an act uh, that absolutely refuses to turn off their in-ear monitor transmitters after their sound check. No, we don't do that. Those are our frequencies. And it's a festival. We got five other acts to fit in there and everybody's using G10. Yeah. It happens. And uh, we do our best to just steer around it. Right. Uh, yeah. Could I just throw, could yeah, go ahead, Jane. On that? So I've been silent because everybody's saying everything that I was going to say anyway. But uh, the way I handle this, I haven't heard it said yet, is not to be the bad guy. It's really not up to us as coordinators to say who has priority. It's up to us to know what else is out there in the frequency world. Yes. But I'll give you an example. Uh, a producer may find that the Y is more important than the wireless comm operating in 2.4 gig. So as a coordinator, I could certainly come up and say, well, your comm system, and, and this has happened to me on specific occasions. It doesn't matter who the brand manufacturer of the show was because our audience base out there is dealing with all sorts of stuff. Uh, but they will come across Wi-Fi, even on a corporate event, and potential comms that have a conflict. It's not up to the audio person or the coordinator to say, no, the comm system has to work, shut down the Wi-Fi, or the Wi-Fi has to work, shut down the comm. So I go to the producer, the tech manager, somebody above in the chain of command up in the food chain and say, okay, here's the conflict. The comms and the Wi-Fi is in conflict, or this operator and that art operator in conflict, who has priority? And in the cases in my past, it turns out the Wi-Fi for the media room, for example, had priority and they put the wireless on wired comms. So it's really not our call, though we need the knowledge to know who's operating where, but we can go to somebody higher up in the food chain to make the call. One of the problems with that is just because it runs in that band doesn't mean it's, it's going to interfere. When you right. do industrial shows with Cisco and IBM, they just say nothing else in the 2.4, nothing else there. Well, we all know that our, our free speak and our Bolero is going to have this much of an effect on the Wi-Fi. So why not let it operate at the same time? Well, they don't understand that. Right. So I'm always one to let the chips fall where they may in that case, since it's not a highly coordinated band. And if there is a conflict, then at that point, you as the coordinator are the only one with the knowledge to go to the producer right. or the tech manager. So Provide the point that. I'm making sure there is a, a, a crash who gets priority? And I'm saying that's not our call as a frequency coordinator. Right. I, yep. I agree. You've got to escalate that to who hired you. Otherwise, you can't be, you'll be a bad guy to someone. You need, exactly. you need, a, you need a bad guy to, to make that decision on your behalf. Yeah, I had a corporate client at a, at a huge corporate uh, uh, meeting worldwide. And uh, the, the client's of the client, the actual company whose meeting it was, put their own IT department in charge of Wi-Fi at this event. Which is and, pretty common. Yeah. And they insisted on seamless Wi-Fi coverage. And it was for critical stuff. I mean, they were doing corporate votes and all kinds of stuff over apps on their phones. And sure enough, the video company hired a subcontractor who showed up with a bunch of 2.4 gig Teradek cameras and which do I interfere was, with Wi-Fi, right? Yes, and I was I was at that point that James described. I had to go upstairs and ended up going all the way up to the client's client to have to explain this to them. And I just laid it out. I said, "Guys, here's here's the situation." Uh, we got these cameras. I mean, they're, they're showing everything you see on those screens every time you show the audience. And I, I had to get that granular too. You know, I had to explain sure. on the very lowest level. And then they're like, thank you. Turn off the cameras, put them on cables. And there it was. Well, if so if I had tried, if I had tried to make the call, I would have ended up out of a gig. Right. Yeah. Yep. 
And I'd like, I'd like to say one other thing about uh, the comment I made about Henry's comment is Henry was right. It is an unlicensed device, but it is built under, what did you say, Henry, a certification? Was that the, the language? Yeah, so equip, equipment is certified. Right. So it is, it is a uh, trying to do any harm, but escalating it up, up the ladder is really your only, your only out. Right. Kevin, did you have something? It looked like you were... Yeah, and back to uh, James's comment, and, and this goes back to a, uh, a couple of uh, conventions a number of years ago. So James was responsible for RF at whatever convention it was. And then uh, we come in as a network broadcaster and also have need for spectrum. There is a coordination process that is, is in place and in, in, and it, it's, it's there and coordinated and so on and so forth. But in this case, uh, and it's applicable to the deck band as well. So at the convention, James Stoffel was representing the production for the event, meaning we, are all, we have all come to this event to cover the event. So anything that James needs, he's first up. He, he gets it. He's first up. And then the others, we coordinate what's left or whatever to work around. So it, it, it's very much an effort of, of cooperation. And now with less spectrum to operate and a lot of equipment that may not be wide band or you don't have a, a certain equipment that's appropriate in this country or that country, whatever it may be, you really have to do your homework uh, ahead of time on this. And I will... Uh, loosely describe a recent uh, event a, uh, that, that took place in one of the Western states where some 1.9 equipment was used at a very high profile event, but that spectrum was already uh, used by other devices at the particular venue, you know, so because we didn't go out and do a survey ahead of time and know what the environment was, that caused a lot of problems after, after the fact. So there is a priority level to who gets it. We don't know what's out there. Even with devices in 2.4, there might be some security or security cameras or life safety devices or access control or whatever. And we want to come in counters. and put an RFPL system there, you know, so you have right. to have advanced knowledge before you deploy. So, you know, to kind of sum that up, I, I heard a few things. One is um, you're really stepping in to, to act more as a mediator when it comes to these decked products, right? That it's, you know, I can't, there's not a lot I can do. I can't, you know, say this, but what I can is, is bring some RF uh, knowledge to the conversation, right? How antennas behave, trying to mitigate the number of the, the coverage area, making suggestions, right? In the case like Jason showed, it was about going to the end client client and helping to educate, right? And sometimes we all get in such a hurry. We're like, you just need to believe what I'm telling you and just do it, right? Instead of, let me walk you through, just take an extra few minutes and let's talk about what's important to you because I don't really care, you know, to me, you want your camera, you want your comms, you want your Wi-Fi, pick one, right? You know, which, it, and you're going to put them in a priority level, like Kevin said, right? In life safety, as more and more devices become apparent, we have to be careful injecting ourselves into a, into a decision that may be above our pay grade and could potentially put us and our client, that could be a production company, in, in a compromised position as well, right? And, and, and never run, I've... never run right to the end client. Uh, I was invited yeah. to go yeah, to that. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> be invited to the office. Yes. Right. Right. And, 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 you know, and keep your technical management and production informed along the way uh, as far as what the problems are. Yeah. They have to respect this process. And it is my belief that in the weeks and months and years to come, frequency coordination, spectrum management, who's on first, advanced RF surveys will become a critical part of any remote broadcast, outdoor broadcast, Olympics, set up for a, you know, a big concert or any of that type of stuff out of necessity. And, and those that we report to 
whether it is a client or your supervisor or your manager, they must come to understand the importance of advanced surveys and knowing what's out there before you deploy. We cannot take for granted you're just going to show up and fire up. Not going to happen or you're going to be yeah. in big trouble. No doubt. So that leads us to our favorite gigs, right? I want to, I got some cool pictures from you guys because we're going to kind of spend the rest of the time here <laughs> talking about some of the, some of the crazy stuff you've done. Um, I would love to hear the stuff, you know, with all the big gear and we've got some photos of that. Um, I also would love you. Here's what I'm going to ask. Everybody has to give me an example of like the craziest, stupidest show they've ever done in their life. Withhold all names. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe where budget is not an issue, right? And you, but I also want to hear where you broke every law of physics in order to do something, right? Cobbled something together, you know, any port in a storm kind of thing. So James, I'm going to start with you because um, you, you, for some reason, to love to live in all the frequency bands that, uh, that, that are available, right? You're, you're that embracer of, if, it's, if I can go there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it, right? So give me a couple examples. I know I got some photos here. Tell me which ones you want me to pull up first. Well, the coolest thing, uh, pull up the uh, inside of a nuke plant. Because, all right. you know, uh, we, we all complain when we have to try to get a, uh, a couple of zones in an open field or a convention hall. But try, try operating uh, over 100 comm systems inside of a metal uh, ball, a metal shield that's designed to absorb RF. Uh, this is from Jim Montgomery, BHI Energy. He has to get over 100 compacts and, um, I don't know, something like 36 channels of base uh, stations up. They have 24 hours to load it in. And look at all that metal, the catwalks, the grids. It's all metal. So, you know, when I, when I feel, have a pity party for myself about trying to get something to work on an open football field, take a look at these pictures. I mean, and they have 24 hours to get them in. And that reactor might be in maintenance for anywhere from 20 to 80 days. And if one wireless pack out of those 100 has a simple uh, failure, a dropout, that area of the plant has to shut down and they have to go through um, safety procedures and, a, and a, an entire um, you know, safety meeting before that, that uh, area goes back up. So now that's a hard job. You know, if we have a pack drop out, yeah, we're going to get yelled at by, by somebody, a tech manager or an audio A1. But can you imagine the responsibility of, of, of being in charge of the comms for just about every nuke plant in the country? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a challenge. That's a load there, isn't it? That's a load to bear. True so, yeah. life safety. Right? True life safety. And a lot of people that could be screaming at you very loudly. And that, that's Jim Montgomery. So uh, he's, he's my hero. Uh, they, they use all rads because VHF travels better in, in that containment facility. Mm -hmm. um, but for, for me, mine was, uh, there's a shot there of, a, of a, an eight-wind helical antenna to the right there. That was at one of the Super Bowls in Houston at Reliance Stadium. And that's when they would have a post-game show after the Lombardi Award. So we were diagonally placed on one corner of the field. The Lombardi it's Award is in the middle of the field. There's about 150 news reporters out there with ENG transmitters on. And then the stage was on the other side of that in the opposite corner. So it was about a little over 400 feet of a diagonal shot through this sea of newscasters with 250 milliwatt electrosonics about a foot away from each other. The noise floor popped up like crazy. So I had professional wireless wind that antenna on the right. It's an eight wind helical, very narrow beam, probably um, 30 dB beam with but it had something like 15 or 16 db of forward gain and that's how we were able to reach all the way to that opposite um corner the picture on the left there uh that's Vern sullivan holding that spiral antenna he custom built it for this game and the guy standing next to him is my dad he worked about 10 super bowls with me and the nfl uh, that looks like it was new orleans based on the color of the seats there and uh, the NFL was getting interference, but they were just back then, it was in the infancy of the program. They were having a rough time. They asked for our help because we're on the field at that point uh, in locating the interference. It turned out to be an intermod from two IFBs that were up in a suite. 
and Vern designed that antenna that had about a two degree beam width and he was able to locate it and he told the NFL guys, he says, well, the interference is coming from that suite that's under the T in Miller time up there on the third level. <laughs> so that's how tight, that's how tight that antenna was. Um, just a, an awesome antenna. I haven't seen anything like it. I use a paddle to direction fine interference. Anyway, that's how tight that was. So there's right. my stories. I'm going to so give that helical. Uh, that was one of our questions we had was a question about that helical. So that was all about the gain, right? That wasn't necessarily the frequency. Right. Well, helicals are generally pretty wide anyway, like about 300 meg or so. Um, but the, uh, the more gain it has, the tighter the beam width. And since I was focusing on a stage over 400 feet away, I could afford to be very tight. That was a spotlight. Question also came up during the uh, PWS uh, uh, discussion that uh, probably should be answered. And that is how much gain do you get off of adding those four wines? You know, cause they showed their uh, two wine version and then a four wine version. Well, that's an eight wine version. Well, you get about three DB whenever you double the amount of wines. So you might say, well, gee, that 3DB doesn't sound like much. Yeah, but if it's difference, difference between, say, 9DB and 15 or 16DB, hey, I'll take that extra 6DB or I'll take that extra 3DB when I need it. Sure, sure. Um, uh, let's see here. I'm going to go back to my presentation here. I've got, um, uh, let's see, I think Kevin, um, since I was going in alphabetical, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up something here. I'm, if I didn't know better, I would say you like uh, Electrosonics, um, the, uh, uh, which is a great company to like. Um, there's your picture there. Uh, he, I love that you sent these wipes here. You know, obviously we haven't talked about COVID and as frequency coordinators, you know, we've established A, that 5G does not cause it, nor does it interfere with it. It, it, it does not interfere, nor does it um, uh, help it. Uh, there, there's uh, Pete with his cleaning thing. So, um, you know, you find that you obviously have a role in this, but this one kind of caught my eye here. Serial number 1776 of the Electrosonics uh, 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 device. Got your little, you know, flag in the background. Tell me about, you know, a couple of your projects, you know, God knows you do a lot of them in a week, but well, I'll tell you, you know, first of all, I am absolutely blessed by being able to work with so many wonderful people uh, at, at, at work, at the major television network, as well as in the industry. I've met throughout my time just some absolutely wonderful people all around the world. And you realize that although we're spaced uh, all, over, all over the planet, we don't see each other on a regular basis. If something happened, there are many, many resources that you can call upon. There is no such thing as a dumb or a stupid question. Somebody like Peter Erskine is one of the greatest mentors in our business. There are no dumb or stupid questions. I've been absolutely blessed. And, and I have said, I, you know, I've lived multiple lifetimes in my 61 years here on planet Earth. And there have been so many wonderful, wonderful uh, adventures. When you, in, in my world, for the most part, what I'm doing is a dynamic existence. Yes, there are pre-scheduled events or shows or remotes that come up, but a lot of time just covering the breaking news or, or going into a severe weather event or so forth. A lot of the ham radio in the CB in the early days and the MacGyver uh, and what you have learned along the way from so many other brilliant, wonderful minds, whether it's a kludge or a combination of all of the above to accomplish the mission, it's, it's, been, it's been great. Um, if I were to uh, say in, in the entire career, you know, what are your, your, top, uh, your top three jobs? Uh, my CPA has long been after me and said, Kevin, you're a great storyteller. You should write a book. You have a lot of pictures. There's a lot of stories to tell. And I said, well, Rich, people don't, they really don't care about this. People in the industry would kind of, you know, they, they, they kind of dig it and it's pretty cool there. I think one of the greatest jobs that I've done in recent years was uh, having the good fortune to cover the final piece of the World Trade Center being installed uh, back in, in 2013. This job was 100% wireless. That is, 
wireless in the in helicopter, microwave, communications to the helicopter, two-way radio. There was no ability to use a cellular telephone when you're 1,776 feet above lower Manhattan. It has to be on RF. So how do you, how do you con convince uh, the producer of a very significant morning television show that you are going to take the anchor man out of the chair and you are going to bring this anchor man up to the top and, and put him in a tower crane and absolutely guarantee that all of your RF stuff works. Well, we, we did that. Again, I'm working with a lot of wonderful people. It was an entirely uh, RF and I, I would say that that is probably one of the most spectacular uh, jobs that I have ever been uh, permitted to work on. And uh, it's, it, it's something that I'm personally very, very proud of. There, yeah, there I watched are, the YouTube of that when they were parked, putting the spire up and, and they were doing um, their, their different segments from there. And you, when you saw from the ground, you realized, holy cow, this is, this is just an unbelievable distance away. And your entire show is built around it. Right. It's not yeah. just, hey, we're going to do a quick hit. We'll be back to you, you know, and oh, we didn't have a good connection today. We'll just move on to the next segment. It was the show, right? It was, it was, it was, it was quite a technical challenge and everything and a lot of fun to um, work on because a lot of the obstacles that w we may have with normal uh, production and so forth were just kind of like blown away. It's like, please let me do this. I won't let you let you down. If there's a problem, I will tell you if there's a resource that I need that I don't have, I will ask. But respectfully, just butt out, part the ways, and let, let, let me take have place. It. But but you you know you also got to be willing, and that's one of the things RF coordinators. That's a difficult job because you have to stand behind your solution. That's what when your been... solution's not working. You you can't just stand back and go, eh, sorry. No. No, I, no. I wish I had better news for you. No, no like no. like Jason did, you got to walk in and you're going to have to walk them through the process of here are the options. And maybe that doesn't make you look so good sometimes, but, it, you know, physics is physics, right? And, yeah, you know, you exactly. mentioned um, how you, you kind of put some stuff together. And I see in this picture here, you know, your two-way with Electro. So um, that's a, uh, that was a pretty neat hot rod piece there. Um, right. and, and I've done this several times. So what you're looking at on, on that particular photograph is, uh, and, you know, we could have a whole separate come. Uh, uh, yeah, that's like a whole here about topic. high yeah. power RFPL and, and, and IFB and comms and all of that type of stuff. You know, in, in New York, we, we uh, operate a citywide IFB system. So there is a two way radio transmitter that is on all the time and we can pump through whatever audio uh, we want on there, whether it's a network program or IFB or a camera peel or whatever the case may be. So in this case, I, I, there are no phone lines. Uh, there were no phone lines at the top of the trade center. The guy that's operating the crane is on a walkie talkie and so forth. So what we did for IFB and comms is just put all of this on two way radio. So what you were looking at there is a actually a Motorola uh, mobile radio, under dash mobile radio, and I had modified this to accept an Anton Bauer uh, uh, camera plate, a battery adapter, and so forth. I'm a firm believer in standard hardware, nuts and bolts, nothing special wherever I can, so I can get a battery from anybody, any cameraman, wherever, and slap it on. So in this case, I needed to have a 450 receiver that was receiving the New York Citywide IFB, and then I needed to rebroadcast that locally uh, at the top of the trade center onto a normal IFB circuit. So essentially what you're looking at, I guess you could call it would be an IFB repeater or relay. So I was receiving something in the 450 part uh, 74 remote broadcast pickup band, and then just running it out on a regular electro uh, IFB, which enabled me to provide multiple copies uh, to camera and producers and others and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. And, and I like that. It sounds like a lot like the Kelly Johnson rules that the, he had back at uh, uh, during the, uh, the early years when they were developing uh, the U2 and then uh, the SR-71 plane, where it's like, look, find the stuff that we already have on the shelf when you need that. And I see even you got your Velcro strips there. I like that. Um, you know, the, um, 
uh, Steve, I'm going to go to you now uh, because um, I'm really into uh, control room pictures, and this is pretty cool. Um, you got a nice setup there, you know, lots of screens because we know that if audio and RF doesn't look good, it can't sound good, right? It doesn't so work unless you've got lots of colors and look? lots of squiggly lines. That's right. <laughs> Right, yeah, so. that, that was London. That was 2012, London 2012 ceremonies. Um, that was actually the audio control room. That did everything that from, you know, all of the desks and things like that, as well as RF. But that was just my little section of it there. Yeah, um, and I, uh, it's a nice setup there. And, yeah. um, you know, that's, um, my, that's yeah. my RF over fiber setup that I built in 2009. Um, there wasn't anything on the market, so I cobbled it together myself with the the help of some engineers from um, PPM Violet in the UK, they did some specially, some custom built um, distributed feedback lasers and stuff for me. And I just built the rest of it. That one's, that one's quite unique. It uses a Simpty fiber to power the actual laser transmitters. Uh, so inside that, inside that little box you see on the side, you've got two channels of, um, of RF coming in. Um, and it, it runs down the uh, single mode, uh, APC Simpty fiber, but the Simpty fiber has actually got four cores of copper in it as well. So it powers the, the laser transmitters from the receiver. Um, you can't quite see the receiver. Receiver sitting underneath that that UHFR there. Mm -hmm. It'll actually power the power the transmitter. So you've got a full duplex, uh, a full diversity input coming into the system, um, and then you can run your antennas or whatever off that. Uh, this is. Um, the top left there, that's, um, people recognize that. This is from Rio. Um, Riedel actually contracted me to design and engineer their, their base radios for them for Rio. Um, so I, I designed a, um, a quite a unique system. It's a, uh, a star manifold system. Rather than using normal uh, combiners to combine it, all of these cavity filters, the output of these cavity filters are using specially tuned quarter wave length stubs from one unit to the other to try and get all of the units onto the one antenna. Uh, this is actually quite a good, it took, took a, a fair bit of time to build. We had to tune each of those little gray um, lines that you see there joining those T pieces. They were all, all tuned to the frequency of the cavity filter. It took about a week to build and um, the, it, it worked quite well actually. I think we had about three dB loss between any transmitter and the antenna. And there was over 40 transmitters. Um, and, we were uh, running. What, what was your yeah. frequency range on these? Uh, this is all. This is all LMR. So this is 40, 402 to four fifty. Okay. Yeah, because uh, in South America, the the, the the band was completely packed at four fifty to four seventy. So we had to go out of band. Did um, you have some uh, moments when you had to change one frequency and therefore have to retune that cable? That we tried to avoid. That's why we did so much work on the coordination before we started building this. Um, because like you say, once you do that, you have to re-coordinate everything and all of those bits of coax get chucked out basically. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we made sure we had all the frequencies running and everything before we started, you know, even building it. And then once we got it all un underway, we just built it, put it together and away it went. It was actually quite a good system. It was very efficient, extremely efficient system very little loss in in the in the transmitter system at all i've the got a bunch of there. photos on the best audio website about that and also a link to uh, uh, some of his design information about that yeah, i think i think you linked the entire design there's a there's a schematic there of the whole exactly. design well there were a few things there. missing we you, we took the frequencies off oh did you yeah right yeah. well it wouldn't yeah. make any difference anyway <laughs> yeah now not now but then it yeah. did Hey, yeah. Steve, out of curiosity, what was the min minimum frequency separation you needed? Oh, geez. On that thing, I think we used probably about 40 kilohertz from memory. I think oh, you got as wow. tight as 40? Wow. Yep. That's quite yeah. good. Well, wow. it, it, it depended. We, we, actually had, we actually had three different um, systems all joined by a standard spider. Um, we had three different star manifold systems joined by a spider. So we'd, we'd interlace the three different systems because the cavity filters themselves had a minimum of 200 kilohertz anyway. Right. So within each, within each system, they were separated by 200 kilohertz minimum because the cavities right. get very inefficient below that. Yeah. Um, and then at the spider join, uh, there was a minimum of 40 kilohertz from okay. one of the three different systems. Yeah. 
You know, one of the things that's, I, you know, we, we look around today and we're so used to, uh, we have such a great uh, um, uh, manufacturing base when it comes to RF, you know, mics and PLs and comms, um, all these things, we're almost spoiled. Um, you know, if we, if we, if we rewound 20 years ago, it made and, it by hand. you know, it, it's, we, you're like, how I need to get 16 more channels out of this Sony UHF rack. <laughs> well, you'll have to buy the super divider, right. In order to do that, because, you know, my little Pascal program that I got from Joe Shidelli, just, you know, it would give me the same exact results every time, but no, no, you can't. And, and now we fast forward to today and we can just walk in. We can go online by that. I mean, go to Amazon, go to BNH and go boom, boom, boom. I would, I would like to throw out though to, to our audience that the opportunity's never been greater though to educate yourself and then create unique solutions like what we saw with Kevin's rig, right? Jason, I, I remember um, seeing your picture of the of your antenna array for the CMAs in June, right? Um, now I don't, we don't think of that as like a hardware device, but it is a solution. That, that, you know, in so many ways, you know, I have a theory that no matter, you know, the, the simplest solution is the correct solution, no matter how complex the simplest solution is, right? And so we'll see, you know, the simplest solution in Steve's case happened to be very complex, right? In the case of sometimes our antenna placements, it is the simplest that we can just reduce it down, right? Keep reducing. And that was my big takeaway when I saw that photo of yours, Jason. It was like, okay, this is, look at this, how simple. Walk in, hook your rig up, right? Leave, right? Oh, you don't want to turn your transmitters off. Great. How about I just disconnect everything from them? That'll be a good first start, right? Um, but the, uh, one of the questions I saw come in was around LED walls, right? Because that's like, the universal trouble, you know, um, Henry, I remember last time I saw you in person, I think we were, we were in Salt Lake City, and I went up to see you and there was, there was you behind a 160 foot LED wall, right? And I thought, how apropos that the RF coordinator is located exactly, you know, 30 feet upstage of this giant noise thing. And everybody's, I personally think LED walls are opportunities. I don't see them as problems. Um, can, how do you, how would you suggest um, changing our communication? We heard a lot about Jason going in with his Teradex. With your experience with LED walls, how do you change the dynamic of the conversation? Uh, you're directing that at me? I'm directing that at you, my friend. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, now having years of experience dealing with LED walls, I will say that on the large productions, the odds of getting a really noisy older wall are much, much less. So you're kind of starting out at a better place than years ago. But it is certainly one of the first questions that I ask of the TD or whoever is my immediate superior on the job I'm being hired for. Uh, what's the LED wall? Can we find out the make and model? Uh, and I like most of the other guys here, probably have a quick list of the stuff that works and the stuff that's noisy. Uh, and even when I get out on site, I, and I know it's a, one of the better brands, I'll still measure it anyway. I'll ask the video guys, give me a full white and I'll go measure it. But if I'm being told it's one of the walls that's particularly noisy or an older wall, uh, I immediately start the inquiry with the person who's hiring me or the TD or whoever the most logical person is to make that first inquiry to, hey, my experience with this wall is it's very noisy. If you're gonna have in-ear monitors or any kind of reception that has to take place close to the wall, this is going to be a problem. Can we try to deal with it now rather than two hours before rehearsals are supposed to start? Uh, and then any at that point, I kind of putting the ball into their court to at least get me to the person who's directly responsible for the wall to see what we can do about mitigating it, uh, maybe discussing the actual needs. Um, I've had choreography changed because the wall was so noisy, in-ear monitors wouldn't work. So the actor or the, 
the talking heads just would not go that far upstage. Uh, you know, as you always say, you try to find the solution. You try to find the easiest solution. You try to find the solution that's going to work for all the parties involved, or at least be the least painless for all the parties involved. And then again, let, let the person whose show it is, whoever wants to own that show, let them make the decision about what the priority is, whether it's the usability of the RF or whether it's the background image in the wall. I, I know what should be more important, but I've been wrong so many times. I just throw it off to them. And if they decide- A couple, we'll couple of years ago, uh, after working on several shows with bad RF, I was asked by a rental house to, um, about the LED walls coming up on the next tour. And I said, well, who's gonna be doing it? And they said, well, we haven't picked one yet. We want you to approve it first. Right. Wow. And, and they went out and I measured a bunch of walls that they, vendors they wanted, picked the two that were superb and it yeah. went great. And I've yeah, actually spoken to um, a couple of the very large vendors who do AV, who bought walls early on. And I actually spoke, was speaking to the head of their audio and their RF department. They said, oh, no, no, we measured these walls before we bought them that, you know, I was very adamant about that so Not the way i measured it even in-house they they got bit uh, they got bit by their own video department because yep. the, they had noisy walls to start with so the audio department got involved in the selection of the walls yeah i had them set up full size walls at least half stage size walls to measure not just a few panels right and that's that's a big problem when they send when the manufacturer wall sends a single 12 inch by 12 inch mo uh, module to the certification lab for FCC uh, certification under part 15 emissions. Yeah. You know, they're only sending one module. When, when was the last time we ever deployed a single module in, a, in an event? And I said, no, you have to send a hundred modules. Right. Yeah. A so, comment, Andrew. comment about the screens. Do you find that it's actually the emitters like the PN junction of the LEDs going on and off, or is it sometimes the power supply, power supply. system, power. Oh. not yeah. just for the screen? Power supplies oh. and the data can the cables cable. connecting yep. them together. Yep, the cable. Well, yeah, I, when I, I when I did this test, uh, I measured only the power supplies with with no signal going out, with them actually disconnected and and found no RF whatsoever. Once the, the LEDs were connected, I had a couple of dB of noise floor on the back of the units right up against them, but nothing on the front. Uh, did a show in a, in a venue in France, walked in, did my spectrum scan, every 20 megahertz, the entire spectrum, there was a big bump coming up. Turned out it was the power supplies in the house video wall, which we had to keep on and use. So I just treated each one of those as the DTV channel in my coordination and just right. stuck all the frequencies in between them. So we yeah, even one, uh, one thing people think is they, of, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Andrew. Go ahead, uh, please. Even the logistics of how the stage electronics is laid out, like Henry was talking about changing um, choreography for, the, for some of the dancers that might've had in-ears. Yeah. That the design of where the power supplies go. So the sooner that production management involves spectrum concerns, yeah. The very head end is critical. So if there's any production management people out there listening, it's you kind of own the spectrum just like you own the parking lot and you own the seats yeah. and you own the air conditioning. It it's a big part of your show to manage very early on. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and we fixate on emissions a lot when it comes to our, our video walls, but we can't forget either some of these productions we work, they surround the entire space. Right in three dimensions with you know the black box open on the front for the audience with video wall which causes us its own problems with shielding and they don't want to see any antennas inside that space but they want the wireless to work in that space right J jason and i work on a uh one on a late night talk show when it does remotes and they used to bring in a week's worth of scenic load in to put in the all of the set so it would look like the show as it comes out of New York. Uh, but the last time out, 
that budget is gone and it's now all the whole set is led walls they just surround the stage with led walls what 80 feet long and 25 30 feet tall yeah we had an 80 proscenium i think they were 32 or 36 tall and 40 deep because it wrapped around right so your only antenna space then to get lines of sight and uh, Fresnel zones is overhead. Uh, some shows I work, that overhead is also a video wall. And, they, you know, you really have to fight. Or a floor. Uh, and a floor. Yeah. <laughs> you really have to fight to find a space to put your antennas. And then you've got the emissions to deal with on top of that. Well, and that comes back to what I was saying before, is you have to, you have to understand the environment you're going into. Uh, before everything else starts to happen. And it, that also comes into play with informing production and technical directors and the client what the physics of the situation is. These are the trade-offs. What do you want as the priority? If it's absolutely more important to you to have this video wall imaging everywhere and you can't have any antennas encroaching whatsoever, the RF is going to suffer. But if that's the priority you want, fine, tell me up front and then I won't stress out over it. Uh, otherwise, let's figure out how to make this work so the cameras, uh, that the antennas may be in the shot, but for all intents and purposes, they'll be invisible unless you know exactly what to look for. All right. So we're going to do, we're going to move from Hollywood squares to lightning rounds. I have no idea what game that is. I'm going to start with the same way I'm going to do the alphabetical. We're going to ask software that you like to use. Shortest phrases possible. This could include coordination software, monitoring software, you name it. Just kind of make a quick list, if you would, of the tools, software tools you like to use in your job. So I'm going to start with Andrew. Um, what, what would be uh, your top uh, you know, one, top three, top five. Well, I use IAS as okay. most of us do for coordination. All right. I've had some conversations with um, uh, their software design people about things I'd like to change or see over time, but uh, it's what I use. I've used for years. And the reason is that it's in the beginning, it was agnostic to the brand. So you could put in whatever brand of equipment you wanted. It didn't have to know that it was a manufacturer X or manufacturer Y. Um, so that's that's where I go to, and I, pretty much everybody at Bexel that does frequency coordination across our our, our corporation uses that software. Okay. Um, in terms of other software, um, I use some software to find radio scanners that can look at you know data constellations and all sorts of inquiry stuff. Um, but that's the only software I really use for my my management of things. Okay, Henry. Uh, IAS, again, is probably my yeah. number one software tool. Uh, my number two tool is probably Visio, so I can draw out uh, the systems and include all the gain structures, include all the information about the deal, uh, about each individual piece of equipment, uh, yeah. whatever notes are necessary. Documentation, all right, I like that. Oh, yeah. Well, I can, I can include no, auto, AutoCAD in my software. Okay. I, I have all my system drawings in a, in. Mm -hmm. the, AutoCAD or something that's uh, more electrical schematic based, and then I export it into AutoCAD. To send <laughs> okay. it to we don't necessarily, we always think about this as what do I, I'm coordinating frequencies, but there are other things involved um, besides, you know, traditional, you know, software that, that moves uh, those numbers. Jason, what about you? Uh, I coordinate with IAS. Yeah. Uh, it's important that you use whatever manufacturer's uh, monitoring and control software for whatever gear you're, yeah. you're working with. Right. If you're, if you're behind, um, yeah. I'm a huge fan of the Signal Hound BB60C and a omnidirectional Sennheiser A1031 U antenna for basic utility work. Yeah. Um, uh, I always have some attenuators with me, uh, 50 ohm attenuators at 3, 6, and 10 dB. Um, and 
you know, it depends on the job you're doing. If it's just frequency coordinating, that's more about the software and organization. So Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. Mm -hmm. um, if you're getting into tech work, then you got to have some tools in your bag. So then I would include filters and whatnot in your most common bands. But uh, that's the basic package. Yeah, so there's your software. James? Well, IAS, it was written yep. in my backyard uh, while we were sitting around the pool when PWS was still in my house. <laughs> and uh, one of my first techs, Jason Eskew, got his basic uh, Microsoft certification. And we, the only program I was aware of back then was a Vega DOS software program. And I it took that. about... It took, it took over a week to do what IAS could do in about 20 minutes. So uh, Jason grabbed the paper and I was cooking burgers for everybody. And I said, here's what we need in the coordination software. Jason mm -hmm. wrote the software and I've been using it pretty much since day one. Yeah. Um, I use a TTI portable analyzer to go fox hunt with because it's relatively inexpensive and it does the job. And then I use the Roden Schwartz with a Schwartz with a tracking generator to tune filters and keep that by the RF rack, look at the output of the uh, antenna splitters because it's a much more um, precise unit. And then mm -hmm. helicals, primarily for antennas, I use helicals for the most part. Okay. Kevin. IAS. What do you like? IAS, okay. <laughs> yeah. IAS. We have yep. established that that's a pretty good program. We think it may yep. stay around, so yep. that's good been using that IAS and uh, wireless designer um, mm -hmm. and depending on what manufacturer equipment you kind of play around but but hands down from the start it's typically IAS okay and then uh, but what for documentation do you suggest for people to you know obviously you're working in a very large plant so you know yeah it's just in a, I just put it and make an Excel spreadsheet make an Excel spreadsheet there you Excel, go I like that yep and a lot of it is on a yellow legal pad with an old-fashioned lead pencil. Yeah, we call that analog. Yeah, it works um, out very good. I don't need a cellular network connection, and I never have to worry about my batteries going dead. There you go. You have to have a pencil never, sharpener. That's it. It'll, it'll never crash, but it might burn. That's <laughs> it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, full, no, serves dual purpose. Take a picture with your camera phone, and you're good to go, right? You know. That's it. That's um, it. We have a pocket copiers now. Steve, how about you? Well, you better get that uh, bell ready because I'm going to jump out of the circle here. I, oh, um, yes, I, yes, yes. <laughs> on workbench all the way, mainly because it, um, when you're doing large coordinations, it doesn't fracture the spectrum. Um, I'll use Visio like, like, like Henry does for doing um, uh, drawings and things of the thing. Excel extensively. I use the XML features in Excel all the time to rip you know, data in and out of the program, in and out of workbench all the time. Um, what else to use? Um, Win Radio is my favourite scanner, mainly because it's uh, it's built in Melbourne in Australia, and I know the guys really well, and they do some custom work for me. I've got a couple of their products, the, the uh, G33 WSM, which I've been using forever. It's got the lowest noise of any scanner still on the market, and a, um, a G39 DDC, which is like their direct digital synthesis one, if you want to really dig into the into the filtering and things like that. Um, for scanners, I use like a handheld one. I've got an Enritsu. It's actually a VNA that I use to when I'm building my RF gear, but it's portable, so I'll take that along. Mm -hmm. uh, antennas, I've got a custom built uh, discone, which is in like a um, it's in a radome. It's like a big black radome that I use for, for Olympic gigs. It's great because you can put it out in the weather, and you know it does DC to daylight. So that's that's what I use for that. Um, what else? That's about it, really. Um, that's, that yeah, seems like a pretty good combination. Pretty old, yeah, and and you know what? Uh, you know, I think you know James is still going to talk to you, even though IES didn't lead. That's okay. I mean, I saw him. He, I, I saw the hands come up for a minute, and then it was like, look, he even took the gloves off. You know, he's he, clearly it's going to be okay. I don't hey, Win Radio was a game changer in um, in uh, SDR radios. I started out with a three thirty. And when it came to making life easy to import your data into your computer, they were smoking the, the major manufacturers on making it simple and easy and cheap. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so James, you can relax. I, I, use, I use IAS, so you can relax. <laughs> I, I don't get a commission on IAS sales, yeah. so it's all right. <laughs> not, not anymore? <laughs> not anymore. I, IAS and P-Touch Labeler. There you go. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's your, your list, Mac. How about you, Pete? 
I'm definitely an IAS fan. Uh, I use IAS uh, exclusively, but I do use Workbench uh, to control my equipment right. because 99% right. of the time it's uh, sure equipment. Unfortunately, there's no easy way other than manually poking the frequencies in to get between them. But uh, 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 once it's in, it's great, particularly if I'm using something like ADX or some remote controllable type mic. Uh, typically, I use um, a, uh, uh, a, a TTI for my walking around kind of coordinating and a uh, Firefox, uh, uh, FieldFox uh, 9912A for my uh, desk work. I switched from the Roden Schwartz because I couldn't see the Roden Schwartz in daylight anymore. Whereas this has a screen that I can look with direct sunlight on it and still see my scan very clearly. Um, coordination documentation, I pretty much stay with uh, Google Sheets, mostly because uh, it, once I'm in Google Sheets, it's available on any of my devices. The, the file is right on the web and uh, also I can get other people like producers or, 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 or TDs to contribute to that for RF uh, labels of, of mics and stuff like that. And then, then it interfaces directly into uh, uh, P-Touch for printing labels. So that's pretty much my world. Okay. So I will just recap IAS wireless workbench. Nine to one, eight to one IAS. There we go. And then, and, and, and then a yellow legal pad so that you always have a backup, right? Because how many times a little notepad, right? When you're out meeting with, with the ENG crews, when your phones, right? Document that stuff. How right? about post-it notes? notes? Post-it post notes, it notes. There's for, note. to hand them out. Hey, you take this one, you take no, this one. There's no excuse to not do something simple, right? Um, so I, when, I, when I'm doing coordination in the field, I insist on texting the frequencies to the person who's getting it and writing their name and phone number in my IAS document so I can text them back. And That's I say, right. if you got a problem, text me. I'll just text you a new frequency back. Yep. Every time I needed to send new frequencies to the PA company for New yep. Year's Eve, it was, a, it was a photograph of my IAS software on my, on my laptop. There we go. These are your frequencies. There's no penmanship. There's no transposing. And you have a permanent record of when you sent it, which is so critical right. in coordination. When yes. did I send you those frequencies? The yellow notepad doesn't always keep track of when you wrote it because it's such a dynamic point. environment. But I also had it all on paper. You know, I had to have the when. I, I never leave it to one thing. Your, your, you know, people's eardrums are your responsibility for some of this stuff. But it's, it's a big deal to yeah, make sure you have a paper trail on it. Good point. And, and this kind of leads us to what our Monday topic is going to be. We have two, actually two webinars Monday. We start with Vectorworks from ground up, how to start a drawing in Vectorworks. All right. And those of us in the entertainment community know that Vectorworks is kind of the default standard for the design software. So great place to make your notes. Great place to uh, um, one of the guys, John Christie, even sent a note over to Andrew Dunning, who did the, the plug in says, what are the chances we could get an RF antenna plug in that, you know, we could take into account um, polarization, take into account um, surfaces that, you know, those same surfaces that make a pretty picture could also help us to track other things, right? So I love that thinking differently. So that's going to be our, our number one in IES Monday afternoon. So if you want to dig in more into IES software, Monday afternoon is going to be that one. It'll be Gary Trenda from uh, PWS. I am going to pull up the contact sheet now because I'm guessing people are going to be like, hey, how do I get a hold of these people? Um, so here is um, uh, everyone's email addresses. Hopefully you can see underneath the, uh, the, the uh, what did I do, line underneath there for those stupid hyperlinks that don't work. Um, and, uh, you know, anyhow, you can send it to, to any of us, myself, Peter, or Mac. We'll, we'll connect you up with these emails as well. Yeah. Will, will, if nobody hit knows uh, yet, this is recorded. Is this recorded? Please? It is recorded <laughs> on the uh, Practical Show Tech website archive. And this sheet with all the contact numbers will be listed there as a download. Nice. Yes. It's Kelly, just a correction. My email is Henry.Cohen. Okay. 
Nobody use this. It's wrong. <laughs> well, except everybody else's is right, maybe. But, you know, Henry, I'm saving you a lot of heartache. Just trust me. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I will get that fixed. Um, good point. And um, I'm going to stop sharing now. And guys, thank you so much. Uh, there were a lot of great questions, a few interesting statements that came in here that we'll uh, address on uh, future, uh, future topics and um, these. And I appreciate um, everybody. Steve, thanks for getting up crack at dawn. Oh, oh my God. God. Oh, look at that. Oh, James, here we go. James barely has a nice share thing. his screen. James, you have to say something to your screen. Hang on, screen yeah, hang on. we got we to gotta make you, uh, you got, Oh, my God. This is awesome. This was um, supposed to be a cage match. My wife went out and bought me this mask just for this two <laughs> seconds of Broadway. You get, you get use out of it in the future. <laughs> oh, my God. That is so good. Oh, man. Uh, and so um, just a second. Um, the uh, well, Okay, I'll do a screenshot later. You're going to have to send that as a photo. That's your new... Um, credential photo uh, James. Uh, <laughs> that's your business card dude <laughs> and just so you know i'm not going to report you this time but if i see that much you know stuff behind oh seriously now you're just taunting all right <laughs> just taunting me at this point uh but thank you again to everybody uh really really appreciate you sharing your time uh your insights um, hopefully we'll find uh, more opportunities and, and everybody who had more questions, reach out. Um, I don't think I've met a more open group of professionals than you, than all of you today. I mean, the, we're, we're in a world now that asks the questions because I'm telling you you now, obviously Kevin, you're pretty busy right now because the news business is busy. You mean, you mean he's not doing it all from his basement? Not me. <laughs> Yeah, but I will tell you this, what you're, you know, no Olympics. Um, Kevin might have like one minute open that he didn't have before. Um, but the, we're in a different world. Ask the questions, communicate with people, um, uh, think differently, right? We saw a lot of cool solutions that aren't off the shelf. They're off the shelf pieces, but you're not going to go to a catalog. Don't be afraid to build a solution. Don't be afraid to investigate it. The best, the best thing you can do. Work. I do see Pete and Mac. We gotta, we gotta pull together some resources for books. Um, I analog RF, digital RF. Right. We need to, We really need to communicate our community because if we're saying, look, get licensed, but get educated. I think we can be a part of that solution. So I'd ask all the panel, please send us any suggestions you might have, advanced, beginner. And let's get that up on our website and help to create an educated uh, uh, community of RF uh, users and uh, future coordinators. So right at the top center of the best audio scans page is five different places. You can take classes in RF coordination. And there you go. So thank you folks. Have a great night. Oh man. You look great, James. James is going to go out in the neighborhood. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll see him on the news, but that's okay. <laughs> He's Florida, man. Oh, yeah. Breaking Pete news back. now. He brought his COVID-19 5G. No 5G gets through this. <laughs> there you go. You see what I'm working with, right, people? So long. Eclectic misfits. <laughs> it's awesome. So long. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Have a Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. I'm coming up. I'm going to bed. All right, get on out. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night.